Asano is a boy who lost his entire family to a horrific car accident not long ago, and through this traumatic event, he was left with a deep dread that he may one day lose what he holds dear once more, causing him to develop crippling social anxiety. One day after the bell for lunchtime goes off, Asano is approached by some of his classmates who just want to hang out with him. Asano can't bring himself to accept their request, even though he really appreciates them asking, and the guys can't believe they've been turned down for the tenth time in a row. They've been in the same class as him for a month now, but they've never gotten the chance to chill with Asano. They still haven't given up on hanging out with him, but they'll just come back tomorrow and ask when he's more mentally prepared. As the guys leave, Asano's childhood friend, Hutsumi, comes up to him and places a bento box on his head. She scolds Asano for turning down an invitation like that when he's got literally no friends aside from her. Asano doesn't see a problem with his behavior, so Mutsumi moves on and says she made lunch for the two of them to share. She knows he hasn't been eating properly since he has to work so much, so this is a non-negotiable meal. Asano eventually gives in to Mutsumi's demands, and as they sit down, Mutsumi talks about how she is worried that Asano might stay friendless for the rest of his life. But it's not like she's much better than him since she rejects every guy that comes up to her almost instantly as well. She doesn't deny it, but she seizes the opportunity to tease Asano for worrying about her so much. But moving on, she really wants him to learn to socialize again, so he can live a normal life like his parents would have wanted him to. However, he doesn't understand how her feeding him is going to help him socialize more. The simple answer is that it won't, but she wants to do it anyway, so Asano just goes along with it, yet, as the food approaches his mouth, it is intercepted by Mr. Harukawe. The dude literally came out of nowhere, so Asano is trying to figure out why he's here in the first place, and Mutsumi questions him about the business trip he was meant to be on right now. Harukawa says he missed her so much that he changed the schedule of his trip so he could come home earlier. He also says something about wanting to rub her hair against his cheeks, not specifying which cheeks though, and Mutsumi is really close to reporting him for inappropriate behavior if he continues. Before he goes, Hirokawa turns to Asano and tells him to head to his office after school is over today because he has a very special private lesson to give him. But he neglects to explain further and Mutsumi seems worried about it. At the end of the school day, Asano's classmates wave goodbye to him, and as they leave, Asano feels dejected because he actually does want to have friends, but ever since the accident, he has been afraid to connect with other people again. He makes it to Hirokawa's office, where Hirokawa has been eagerly awaiting his arrival. And now that he is here, they both take a seat on the black couch, suspiciously close to one another. The awkwardness is killing Asano, so he asks Hirokawa why he was called here, so Hirokawa answers that he just wanted to share some photos from his special homework folder with him. His saying that is weird enough, but what makes it even worse is that all the pictures are of Mutsumi. Asano is now sure that Hirokawa is a lost cause, so for the safety of his only friend, he is going to have to report him to the police later. Hirokawa continues showing Asano of his pictures of Mutsumi, but now, they are getting younger. He has ones of her when she was seven and five, and even some from her third birthday party. But that begs the question, how did he get those photos if he is just a teacher at the school? Things take a dark turn as Hirokawa states that he has been watching Mutsumi for a long time now, and one thing he can't stand is undesirables trying to get close to her. Which is why he had to have a nice little chat with the last guy who asked her out on a date. Asano is scared out of his mind right now since he's now Hirokawa's next victim. Hirokawa has been ignoring him because he and Mutsumi are childhood friends, but the situation has changed so he needs Asano gone now. Asano can't muster the strength to fight back or run away because his legs are frozen in fear. However, before Asano can become a missing person, a girl dressed in white jumps into the room and flashbacks the whole place. Luckily, Hirokawa has a natural resistance to flashbangs since his eyes are always closed, but he still got distracted enough for the girl to snatch Asano away and take him to safety. Asano later wakes up to Mutsumi, who is glad he's okay, but then he looks around some more and realizes that he is surrounded by a bunch of weirdos, so he freaks out over it and tries to get away. He asks Mutsumi who all these strange people are, and it's kind of a long story, but they are basically her siblings. She introduces them all to him as Futaba, Shinzo, Shin, Kengo, and Nano, and their guard dog Goliath. She also tells him that they are a family of spies and it feels so good to finally come clean about it, after keeping it secret for over 10 years. Asano still can't wrap his head around it all since for the longest time he had thought they were just vegetable grocers. But instead of eggplants and radishes, they deal with guns, intel, and narcotics. 
He thinks this must all be some elaborate prank, so the guns must be fake and to test it out, he tries firing one, but it actually goes off. Futaba explains to him that being a spy isn't really all that strange anymore. With the current economy, you gotta do what you gotta do to make ends meet. But times are tough with all the cheap public servant spies popping up, so their only edge on the market is their 4.8 star reviews. They'd also got their big brother Kyuchiro, who gives them quite the popularity boost, but he also generates an equal amount of hate. Asano recognizes their brother as Kurukawa from school, and Futaba confirms that it is actually him. He has his flaws, but as far as skills go, he is by far the best in the family at spy work. Asano asks why Kyuchiro would try to kill him all of a sudden, so Futaba informs him that they got a tip that someone may try to assassinate Mutsumi. He knows he would never do something like that, and Futaba is inclined to believe him since their tip did only come from social media. But Kyuchiro has been obsessed with Mutsumi ever since he nearly caused her to die, so due to his sense of guilt, he would do everything within his power to protect Mutsumi, even if that means keeping her away from all other people. He never liked Asano, but since he is childhood friends with Mutsumi, Kyuchiro always gave him a pass to hang out with her. But now he has a reason to justify getting rid of him, so he won't stop until Asano is gone. Futaba apologizes to him for her brother's obsessive behavior, but speaking of him, an alarm goes off which tells them that he is here. He probably intends to finish off Asano now, but they all assure him that he is safe with them. They've locked all the entrances and set all the traps they have on hand, but even with the 5 on 1, they only have a win rate of about 30% when they fought him in the past. However, the only way she can guarantee that Asano survives for sure is if he marries Mutsuni, because there's a rule that prevents any killing among family members. Kyuchiro will still probably hate him, but you won't be able to kill him at least. All he needs to do to officially be married to her is to exchange rings, so it's not a bad idea as far as Futaba is concerned. Asano isn't opposed to the idea of being married to Mutsumi, but the thought of having another family triggers his fear of losing it all, so he remains silent. Mutsumi speaks up and says she refuses to get married to Asano, not because she doesn't want to, but rather because she knows how hard it is for him to form new connections, so she doesn't want to force him to join a family. Futaba understands and apologizes for being so inconsiderate, but that means they're going to have to go with the 30% win rate plan, and while they are trying to come up with a strategy, Kyuchiro shows up on the couch without any of them noticing. They are all shocked that he made it past all the traps that were set, but he at least praises Shinzo for doing a good job with them since it was annoying for him to deal with. Since it has come to this, Futaba gets in front of Kyuchiro and warns him to stay away from Asano, but he's still dead set on killing him since he considers him a threat to Mutsumi's safety, and all threats must be eliminated. If she disagrees with his methods, then she's going to have to stop him by force, and that's exactly what she plans to do as she grabs his tie and begins spinning him around. Futaba then slams him down into a chair and calls for the others to join in, so Shinzo uses his robot arms and Nanao uses steroids. While they keep Kyuchiro busy, the rest of them try to get Asano and Mutsumi to safety, but their attack fails to do any real damage to him since he blocks it all with his wires. Kyuchiro then proceeds to slice up everything in the surrounding area, forcing Nanao and Shinzo to jump back. The weapon he is using is one specially made for him called Steel Spider, and he is quite skilled with it. So Futaba tells Mutsumi to take Asano and run for the hills because she doesn't know how long she can hold him off. She charges at Kia with her bare hands, and she seems to be doing something special to get through his wire attacks. But in the end, it isn't enough as she gets tied up and hung from the roof of the house. She and tells Kengo to get Asano and Mutsumi out of here, while she holds him off instead. But there's no chance she manages to take Kyo down when Futaba failed so easily. She activates all of her killer drones at once and they all open fire on Kyo at once, but she must have programmed them with Stormtrooper aim because those things haven't hit him once. Back with Asano and the others, he asks if the one who stayed back to fight Kyo are going to be alright, so Mutsumi assures him that they'll be fine. They may get a few broken bones, but Kyo isn't allowed to kill any family members. That aside, they need to find somewhere to hide Asano, so they open up a hidden safe behind a painting and get Asano to step inside, and before locking him in, she reassures him that she won't leave him no matter what. After Kiyo is done taking care of the others, he corners Mutsumi and who he believes to be Asano. He asks Mutsumi to get away from Asano so she doesn't get stained by his blood after he kills him. So she starts approaching him, but then she draws a gun and attacks, prompting Kiyo to restrain her. 
He realizes that this isn't actually Mutsumi, but he's got to say that he's impressed with how much detail Tango put into his disguise. It was perfect enough to fool him for a moment, right down to the number of eyelashes. However, his skills at disguising other people still need some work because he can tell that that isn't Asano over there. Mutsumi takes off her disguise and asks Kyo to please not kill Asano because she is certain that he isn't trying to kill her. Kido finally relents and says he won't try to kill Asano anymore, but in exchange, she's going to have to accept that he won't let her leave the house anymore. He believes he has been doing a half-assed job at keeping her safe, so from now on, he'll always keep her by his side and make sure that she doesn't get put in danger by all those pesky risks like school or romance or fun. He's willing to risk his life for her, and stabs himself with the knife she had in her hand to prove that to her. So all he wants is for her to give up everything she enjoys doing so that he can keep her safe forever. Mutsumi is willing to resign herself to a joyless life under her brother's control if it means that Asano won't have to die, but Asano is not okay with this. He steps out of his hiding spot and tells Kyo to let go of Mutsumi, but Kyo has lost all interest in Asano, murderous or otherwise, so he just tells him to leave and stay out of his family business. Asano understands that Kyo doesn't want to lose his precious sister again, but the way he's going about doing that is totally wrong, so he tells Mutsumi that he's willing to marry her after all. Mutsumi smiles and throws the second half of her ring to Asano, but as he is reaching for it mid-air, Kyo catches it with his wires. There's no way he would allow Asano to go through with his plan and go swooping in on his family's business, but Asano has a large debt to pay back to Mutsumi for always taking care of a nervous wreck like him, so he uses sheer willpower to break through the threads and grab the ring. After recovering from the beating Kyo gave them, the others rush in to check on the situation and they find Asano just as he puts on the ring and officially becomes a member of the family. Everyone welcomes him with open arms, all except Kyo who's still standing over there in shock. Futaba walks up to him and tells him he lost this round, but this is no time to be upset since he's still about to teach Asano a lot of things so that he can actually protect Mutsumi when needed. His last name is now Yozakura, so everyone calls him by his first name Taiyo. After that eventful evening, Taiyo was ready to go home and go to sleep. Mutsubi asks if he'll be alright heading home by himself, but he says he'll be fine. However, he's a bit worried about what happened to Kyo since he's lost all the color in his body, but Futaba reassures him that he's fine, he's just having a hard time accepting that he lost his sister to him. As Taiyo gets home, he is still having a hard time believing what happened, but since he is exhausted, he passes out on the bed. But by the time he wakes up, he sees Kyo standing over his bed with a knife ready to stab him. Taiyo manages to dodge on reflex alone, so Kyo commends him for that, but that still doesn't answer the question of why he is in his room so early or why he has a knife with him. Kido doesn't see the issue and just says he is here to give Taiyo the traditional Yuzakura family wake-up call, but morning calls usually aren't so lethal. Kyo defends himself by saying a spy must always be prepared to handle a threat, so he is actually teaching Taiyo how to be more vigilant, but this next part, this is purely for revenge. Downstairs, Mutsumi is enjoying her time making a bento box for Taiyo, so when she hears Taiyo's voice, she heads upstairs to greet him but finds him being puppeted around by Kyo. Mutsumi asks what's going on here, so Kyo says he's just having some morning exercise with Taiyo, however, she doesn't appreciate what Kyo is doing so he takes the hint and backs off for now. But then he looks at his watch and tells the two that they don't have much time left, so that he grabs Mutsumi and drags Taiyo out the window of the second floor, just before the building explodes. Taiyo has a lot of questions about why his house just went boom, but Kyo says he'll explain everything later. For now, he's putting his feud with Taiyo on hold and lets him know about the most important mission of the Yozakura family. Protecting the Mutsumi Yozakura at all costs. He suggests they leave because the explosion surely attracted a lot of attention, and as he walks away, Mutsumi calls for Taiyo to come along. In the limo, Kyo gets off a call of Shinzo who has already analyzed the explosion site and informs them that a bomb was planted in the kitchen. Taiyo has no clue why there would be a bomb in his house if Kyo wasn't the one who planted it, but it's likely because the target was Mutsumi. Information in the spy business spreads like wildfire, especially when a certain someone goes on social media to rant about losing his sister to a boy, but Taiyo still doesn't know the reason Mutsumi is being targeted. Kyo informs him that it's because she is the tenth head of the Yozakura family. The Yozakura family lineage can be traced back to the Edo period with ninjas. Over the decades, the family has produced various members, all with superhuman abilities. But there is always one ordinary person born into the family called the Head. And though the Head may not have any superhuman abilities themselves, their children will always be raised to possess the abilities of the Yozakura gene pool without fail. 
So the superhuman family protects the head, and the head gives birth to the next generation of Yozakura superhumans. But as her siblings, they don't really care about keeping the bloodline pure or anything, and they just want to let her live her own life as she pleases. However, Mutsumi retorts that all her siblings are risking their lives to protect her, so she must also fulfill her role as the family head. Kido is left in tears over how honorable his sister's sense of duty is, but he can't handle the fact that she's married to a stooge like Taiyo. His personal frustration aside, Kido further explains that Mutsumi will eventually have to make her debut as the head of the Yozakura family, but before then, her mission is to gather as much knowledge about the ordinary world as possible, which also means she is inevitably going to be exposed to all manners of villains who wish to destroy the Yozakura family. Like right now, for instance, as a black van tailing and fires an RPG at them, but the limo drifts out of the way. Inside, Taiyo starts panicking and asks what's going on, but immediately after, the men in black all pull out their assault rifles and begin firing at the limo. Taiyo freaks out again, but the others are pretty calm about it since they're used to this kind of thing. Plus, the car is completely bulletproof, so they aren't in much danger. Kyo snaps his finger and the car's souped-up engine goes into overdrive to outpace the attackers. All the drifting and dodging explosives is making for a really bumpy ride, so Kyo asks if the driver could drive a little smoother so he doesn't spill his tea. However, the driver turns out to be a family dog, Goliath, so Tayo starts freaking out even more than before. Goliath is forced to hit another sick drift to avoid an RPG, but that causes Mutsumi to bump into Tayo, and right then and there, Kyo decided this chase had gone on for long enough. He jumps up on top of the roof and the attackers recognize him, but the leader just tells them to fire despite his reputation. Once he is done, Kyo gets back into the car and once again emphasizes that the mission of the Yozakura family is to keep Mutsumi safe from danger at all times. And that applies to Taiyo as well since he is now part of the family as well. He now has a duty to protect Mutsumi, so to help him accomplish that, Kido is going to drill the basics of being a spy into him. He pulls out a gun from his jacket and tells Taiyo that his first mission is going to involve keeping Mutsumi safe from all the assassins that will be coming after her today. Later, they arrive at school like normal and Mutsumi greets her classmates as usual, but Asano rushes in after her and begins frantically checking every inch of the room for anything that could be a threat. The others think he's acting stranger than usual today, so they ask Mutsumi if anything happened to him recently, and a lot certainly has, but she can't tell them that. The guys who want to be Taiyo's friend come up to him to see how he's doing, but Taiyo isn't in much of a talking mood right now. Before they left the limo, Taiyo was hesitant to take the gun. So Kyo assured him that even if he ended up killing someone, that the family would just sweep it under the rug, so there's nothing to worry about, but Taiyo still declines. Mutsumi speaks up for him and tells Kyo that it's not very funny to off Taiyo a gun, making him think she understands him. But what she really meant is that assassins usually try to use poison or explosives so a gun wouldn't be of much use to him. Kyo admits she is right, but having a gun will still give Taiyo some peace of mind. His mission will be to defend Mutsumi from a reputable bomber named Tamea. The bombs this guy makes are first-rate, and Kiyo has even worked together with him once before to stop a terrorist group. But just because they know each other doesn't mean there's any amount of loyalty between them. Spies can switch up on each other at a moment's notice for any reason at all, so you can never really trust anyone. That aside, Tamea has one major flaw in that he is addicted to social media, so he ends up posting about his later jobs and targets on there. Kiyo would have liked to tag along with Taiyo, but he's got hostages to rescue so he leaves him with a warning. He can't let his guard down at all when Tamea is on the loose because that guy is notoriously twisted when it comes to getting his jobs done. He usually starts with lighter bombs to get your guard down, then he hits you with the specialty ones that he is proud of and those ones pack a punch. Back in class, Taiyo has checked the whole classroom, but he hasn't found anything resembling a bomb yet. However, that doesn't mean Mitsumi is safe because the attacker may have already infiltrated the school, so he can't leave her side no matter what. Just then, Taiyo gets an update on Tamea's page that they have planted the second bomb already, so he's now panicking because he has to search the entire school to find it before it blows up. He notices a suspicious person up in the building. He rushes over to check it out, but just as he is about to enter the infirmary to search for the bomb, he gets caught off guard by the nurse who asks if he needs anything. Taiyo gets nervous and just says he's fine before walking away, but as he does, the nurse smiles menacingly. But once he turns back, she has somehow vanished and we see a note on the door saying the actual nurse isn't here right now. Back in class, Mutsumi is having lunch with her friends and they are all talking about how there are rumors going around school involving sightings of UFOs as well as a giant 3 meter tall guy. And aliens that can mimic other people's appearances perfectly. As you may have already guessed, these are Mutsumi's family members who are snooping around the school for her safety. But she's not going to mention that to her friends. 
Meanwhile, Taiyo doesn't know what to do anymore since Tamea's social media says they have planted the last bomb as well, but he still hasn't found the second one. He takes a break to look over at Mutsumi, and now that he thinks about it, after watching her all day, he notices that she never eats food right away when she's given some, and she makes sure she's never alone so she's not an easy target. She looks cheerful all the time, but she's always cautious of her own safety. Just then, Taiyo's friends approach him to give him a chocolate, but they are shocked when Taiyo just accepts the chocolate, because normally, he would have nearly fainted the second they mentioned his name. Taiyo was so preoccupied with Mutsumi that he had completely forgotten he had crippling social anxiety, but it kicks back in almost immediately. They think about taking him to the infirmary for treatment, but one of the guys mentions that the nurse isn't here today, so they call for the next best person, Mutsumi. Taiyo wakes up in Kyo's office a while later with Mutsumi looking over him. She asks if he is alright and Taiyo is fine, but he asks her if she is really sure she wants to be married to a guy like him. They are childhood friends, but he knows almost nothing about her. He never knew about her family or her position as the head, or the fact that she was in danger and through all that, she still decided to stay by his side when he needed her. Mitsui chops in on the head for being too negative about the whole thing. Besides, she thinks Taiyo got the worst end of the deal here since he has been married into a crazy family of spies and his wife could be killed at any moment. Anyone who would normally agree to an arrangement like that would be way too crazy to even consider as a husband. But she has always wished for Taiyo to be her husband one day, so she's incredibly happy that he married her. Taiyo was about to say something, but then he notices a bomb planted in the ceiling and seconds later it goes off. Taiyo managed to get her to safety before the bomb went off, but he doesn't understand how Tamea could possibly have known they were going to be here. They just happened to come to this office, but that's when he realizes that Tamea has been playing the long game this whole time. He has been using Taiyo's movements to target Mutsumi without him knowing that makes Taiyo realize that he may be used to target her again. So he starts unbuttoning his shirt so he can check something. And his suspicion is confirmed as he finds a bomb stuck to his shirt, which must have been placed there during gym class. Tamea probably kept posting about the bombs to make sure Taiyo stayed within range of Mutsumi trying to protect her. Taiyo is a lot of things, but he's not about to let himself become the bomb that kills Mutsumi. So since the exit is blocked, he eats himself out of the hole in the wall to save Mutsubi from the explosion. Luckily, before he could die a fiery death, Taiyo is saved by Kyo who just got back from finishing up his mission. He applauds Taiyo's quick thinking and realizing Tamaya has planted the bomb on him. It may be small, but it packs a major punch to it. However, it has one fatal flaw in its design since it is so simple that a well-placed wire is able to cut off its detonation. After the worst of the danger is over, they sit back down and Taiyo asks what they should do with the bomb since it's still active. The only sensible thing to do would be to return it to its owner, and it just so happened that some other family members have found him already. They all heard it was Taiyo's first mission, so they all wanted to help him out. Kiyo then proceeds to tie up Tamea who begs for mercy, but there is no mercy to be given. He gets flown hundreds of feet into the air and once Kiyo retracts the wire that was keeping the explosive from going off, Tamea dies a fiery death. But before he went out, he still had to make one final post on social media saying hashtag, about to die now. But now that that's taken care of, there's still the issue of Taiyo currently being homeless since his house got blown up, so Mutsumi decides it would be great for him to come live in the Yazakura house. Kiyo is obviously against it, but Taiyo is her husband after all, so he has no right to refuse letting him stay here. However, that doesn't stop him from making threats on his life. The next morning, Taiyo wakes up from a terrible nightmare where he was unable to save Mutsumi from a large, shirtless man who had her in his clutches. After realizing it was only a dream, he recalls all the crazy stuff that happened yesterday which wasn't a dream, and how he ended up living in the Yozakura house. But it's going to take some getting used to as he accidentally steps on Goliath's tail and gets himself sentenced to death by a thousand scratches, and everyone already knows exactly what happened from the sound of Taiyo's screams. Later, Mutsumi is patching Taiyo up and apologizes for what happened to him. She had asked Goliath to keep watch over him so that he wouldn't end up getting assaulted by Kiyo in his sleep and Taiyo knows that Kiyo would totally do something like that if given the chance so he appreciates the gesture. Mutsumi then picks Goliath up and scolds him for hurting Taiyo even though his job was to protect him, but that makes Taiyo nervous because he knows Goliath lashes out whenever people touch him. However, he seems to like Mutsumi since she's the head of the family and would never attack her. But the same doesn't go for Taiyo. Later that day, Taiyo meets with Futaba and begs her to help make him stronger. But she assures him that they were already planning to train him but by bit to accommodate for his ordinariness. However, that isn't good enough for Taiyo, the last incident made him realize that he is severely underprepared for the takes of keeping Mutsumi safe from danger, and he nearly ended up killing himself as well. 
is since Mutsumi chose him as her husband, he wants to be strong for her sake. Which is touching and all, but Futaba grabs his shirt and begins tossing him around the room to prove a point. She says that she may not look like it, but she has immense talent for martial arts. And even with those talents, it took her three years of training before she was allowed to go on her first mission. So in his case where she has no talent to speak of, it would inevitably take even longer to train and simply having strong emotions isn't going to change that. But with that said, she doesn't want to let all his motivation go to waste. So she offers him the chance to try out the Yozakura family all-out training regime. But she has one condition before they can begin and tells Taiyo that he must live in this mansion for one month first. He is surprised that that's all she's asking of him. But it was due to their carelessness that his house got wrecked. So she wants him to live here as part of his training. And then the real training will begin in one month. Taiyo is about to thank her. But as soon as he gets up, a trap door opens beneath his feet and he nearly plummets to his doom. Futaba apologizes about that as there is one more thing she forgot to mention. This entire house is filled with traps designed for spy training, so if Taiyo can't master the beginner stuff that the house may throw at him, then all of training is never going to happen. Taiyo may have been the one that came here to ask for training, but now he's worried he may end up dead after just one day. The next morning, an alarm clock goes off to wake him up, and it's not a suggestion either as the clock explodes after a few seconds of Taiyo trying to ignore it. He runs out into the hall to escape it, but he ends up setting off another trap that deploys a flamethrower, so by the time he gets down for breakfast, he's pretty much well done. Mutsumi apologizes for the craziness of her family, but Futaba tells him the exploding alarm clock is necessary so that he builds the habit of getting up immediately. Taiyo takes a bite of his breakfast and asks how Mutsumi has managed to live in this house for so long when she's ordinary as well, but she answers that she doesn't have to deal with any traps since they don't activate for her. Shun elaborates by telling him that the traps can be turned off once he has been accepted by the house. They are all controlled by a computer system, so if he manages to clear every single trap in the house, then he will officially be accepted as a member of the Yozakura family, allowing him to turn them on or off at will. The others turn the traps off when they are injured or if they just don't want to deal with it. And if Taiyo works hard too, he may be able to do the same in two years maybe. Taiyo doesn't like the sound of that two-year time frame, but a moment later, his guts start working against him and Futaba tells him he should have been paying better attention to what he was eating. Everyone in the family, with the exception of Mutsumi, has their food laced with a tiny amount of poison to help build immunity, but Taiyo doesn't have to worry because it's only enough to turn him into an ass blaster for the morning. But something he does need to worry about is the fact that the bathroom door has 20 locks on it for some reason. Kyo walks past, and while he doesn't do anything to Taiyo, he greatly enjoys watching him suffer. In order to get in, he needs to be able to pick the lock and crack the password in under a minute, but it's cruel to expect him to do it on his first try, so Shin goes over to help him before the ass blasts all over the floor. The next day, everyone's alarm clocks go off again, and they all stop it from exploding in their own way. Except Taiyo, who still hasn't gotten the hang of things yet. The traps are integrated into everything he does getting breakfast results and getting gunned down. Turning on the television required him to shoot the button with a gun, and even taking a shower almost gets him waterboarded, so by the time he finally heads to school, he's completely wiped out. His friends ask him if he is alright, but he says he is fine, so they leave him be. By the end of the day, he is completely exhausted, but after going to check up on Mutsumi, he sees that she was working really late into the night, so he covers her with a blanket and decides to put in some extra work as well. So he heads outside to practice his aim, but he still classifies as a stormtrooper in this apartment. He is dead set on practicing some more until he finally gets the hang of it, but then Mutsumi calls out to him and asks that he take a break with her. They both sit down inside, and Mutsumi pours him a cup of tea, before asking if he is sure he isn't going too hard on himself with all the training recently. Taiyo doesn't want to admit it, but she knows he's trying really hard and it's because he thinks he is weak, but Mutsumi doesn't think of him that way. She recalls the old days when they were neighbors, but they weren't especially close to one another at the time, however, when she started junior high, she started getting bullied for her white hair streak by some girls who were jealous of her. And Kiya wasn't around to make them disappear, so Mutsumi was left at the mercy of their cruel, scissor-happy tendencies, but then Taiyo arrived and he put a stop to the bullying by cutting his own hair without saying a word. His confusion tactics seem to have worked as the bullies become so scared that they all ran off. Once the girls were gone, Taiyo dropped the scissors and told Mutsumi that he had been meaning to cut his hair anyway, so she doesn't need to worry about it. 
She still felt bad about it, but he insists that it isn't a problem. And from that day on, the two became really close friends with one another. He has been protecting her all this time, so she assures him that he doesn't need to push himself so hard now. Some time passes and Tayo wakes up one morning, managing to stop the explosive alarm clock before it goes off again. He then makes his way through the hallway without setting off any of the traps. He walks into the living room and greets Shinzo, as he once again tries to turn on the television with a gun. His aim has improved to the point where he can hit the power button, but changing channels is still a bit difficult for him to do, so Shinzo gives him a couple of tips on how to reduce recoil when he fires the gun. Soon after, Shin enters the room and she is impressed that Tayo can now turn the television on with ease. She came to give Shinzo some of Tayo's performance data which she analyzed for him, and Tayo is very thankful for all the help they are giving him. But he's got a question he's been dying to ask. He asks Shin why Shinzo is always in a garbage can. But the answer is pretty simple. And it's because he is just really shy and lazy, so he almost never leaves the mini tank he built himself. But that aside, she tells Tayo to hurry up because he was supposed to meet Nanao to learn how to deal with poisonous gas. As he leaves, Shinzo says he thinks Tayo has some real talent with this spy stuff. But while Shin agrees that he is progressing really quickly, it is all due to his own hard work. Later, Futaba and Tengo are walking down the halls when they come across Tayo and Nanao doing nerve gas training. Tengo tries to interrupt, but Futaba kicks him back into place so Tayo can train in peace. Although she notices that there's something wrong here. Some more time passes and Taiyo is now able to breeze through the morning routine without a hitch and Mutsuni is really proud of how far he has come in just three weeks of living here. He asks her to pass him the milk, but one thing he hasn't managed to adjust to is the mild poison doses, so he once again is forced to race for the toilet. However, he also hasn't figured out how to crack the codes on the door. So Tengo goes over to help him before he has an accident, but as he gets there, he finds Tayo passed out on the floor. So everyone rushes over to check on him and Futaba asks Nano to get some medicine ready for him. Tayo later wakes up on Nano's diagnostic table and luckily all he has is a fever brought on by fatigue. So if he rests for the rest of the day, he should be fine. Or at least he would be fine if he didn't have such extensive injuries. Futaba had been on to the fact that he was hiding something for a while now since there's no way to achieve extraordinary results like Tayo did without taking drastic measures as well. He hid how much he was overworking himself with the help of the others and Futaba is especially disappointed in Nanao for enabling this self-destructive behavior. Tayo tells her it's not the others' fault since they tried to stop him when he started this, but he was stubborn about it and pleaded until they reconsider because he wants to be able to protect Mutsuni as soon as possible. Futaba chops him on the head for being so foolish and not realizing that he can't take care of Mutsumi if he can't take care of himself first. She gives him a book on the basics of code breaking so he has something to do while he recovers from his wounds and Tayo thanks her for being so considerate. But once she leaves, Futaba thinks to herself that Tayo's resilience is really unbelievable. Normally, if someone drives their body to the brink of collapse so often, their spirit would shatter long before their body ever gave out. But Tayo continues to train hard for Mutsuni, and that may mean he has what it takes to protect her after all. A couple of days later, Tayo has recovered and is finally able to unlock the bathroom door on his own which is a cause for celebration. And since he has finally beaten all the traps in the house, he is granted admin access to turn them off and is officially recognized as a Yozakura now. Futaba personally praises him for all the hard work he has been putting in over the last month, but from now on, he will be receiving the intense Yozakura family training, so he had better be prepared. For starters, Shinzo pulls out a 100 kilogram shirt for Tayo to change into and Shin increases the difficulty of the traps, so Tayo is in for even more hellish training already. The next morning, while Mutsumi is busy preparing a meal for the family, Tayo comes in and asks her to show him how to put on a bra properly. Mutsumi never thought she would hear those words from Tayo, but she tries to remain positive and tells him that she will always love him no matter what he does. Even though her face clearly shows that she does not approve, Tayo pleads with her to not look at him like that because this is just a misunderstanding. He was just doing this because he has to practice his disguise techniques, not because he wants to. But if that's the case, then this girl is here to show him how it's done. Mutsumi recognizes that the girl is Tengo, who is a believer that it takes a real man to become best girl. And he's going to make sure Tayo learns to do this too, whether he likes it or not. A while later, Shinzo walks into the kitchen and sees Tayo in a bra while Mutsumi and another girl are on top of him. But who is he to judge what a married couple enjoys doing together? Tayo doesn't want to give Shinzo the wrong idea here, so he clears up that the girl is actually Tengo in disguise. 
Then Kia walks in, asking Mutsumi for a goodbye kiss, and that was the breaking point for Mutsumi. So she smacks him in the head and gets everyone to settle down so she can go back to cooking. After that eventful morning, Taiyo is talking with Shinzo, who is meant to go on a mission today, but he just needs to retrieve the original plate for some counterfeit money. So it shouldn't take him too long, but before he forgets, he has a gift he wants to give Taiyo. Later on, Taiyo and Mutsumi arrive at school, and Mutsumi apologizes to him for all the craziness that went on that morning, but all of a sudden, a rogue baseball comes flying straight from Mutsumi's head, but Taiyo catches it without even looking and is able to throw it back with such force that the coach offers him a baseball scholarship on the spot. However, he isn't interested, so he just keeps walking with Mutsumi. Once lunchtime rolls around, Mutsumi and Taiyo sit on the roof heat together, and Mutsumi takes the opportunity to point out to him that while he may not have noticed, he is becoming more superhuman with each passing day, so if he isn't careful, he may end up giving himself away. People are already calling him a ninja with how no one can hear his footsteps or see him coming, so he agrees that he may be drawing too much attention to himself. He goes in for a bite, but just then, Mutsumi remembers that there's something she wanted to ask Taiyo if he is free after school, because there's something she would really appreciate his help with, and later we see Mutsumi enter worker mode and handle mountains of paperwork with extreme efficiency. And she's not just stamping away either, as she is meticulously looking over each document for discrepancies, and if she finds any, the contract is rejected immediately. She keeps going through the paperwork until she finds some that belongs to Tengo, which he didn't fill out properly. She takes it to his room, and as soon as they get inside, they are greeted by this mess. Kengo doesn't appreciate them invading his privacy, but Mutsumi believes this is necessary because he keeps forgetting to attach the paperwork for his reports. She commands that he find the relevant documents right now, but Kengo doesn't think it is such a big deal, and would rather just keep eating his sushi. Taiyo tries to defuse the situation and says that the form must be around here somewhere, so he offers to help Kengo look for it. Kenko tells him that it's not such a good idea to go poking around here because there's a lot of dangerous stuff just sitting in his pile. And besides, Kengo has no intention of searching for the document because he refuses to do boring tasks, including wearing clothes. Mutsumi tells him to get dressed, but he refuses, saying he needs to let his skin heal. After all the disguises he has been putting on, but even if that's the case, he could at least make an effort to hide his dong from his little sister. Kengo doesn't see what the problem is since they used to take baths together just a couple of years ago and she would always cling to him in the bathtub. He thought she was really cute back then, but now she's more of a nagging mom than anything. Mutsumi takes offense to this, so she feels like it's time she punished Kengo since she is the head of the family, and as soon as Kengo hears this, he just smiles and starts running. Taiyo tries to stop him, but he instantly disguises himself as Mutsumi to throw him off, so he manages to escape. But he isn't going to get very far because Mutsumi then activates the house's lockdown sequence, so no one is leaving until Tengo gets his punishment. Meanwhile, Shinzo is out on his mission and is crawling through an air vent until he finally locates the counterfeit money. But no matter how he looks at it, the technology they got and the airtight security seem like way too much for a basic counterfeiting operation. He overhears a conversation with the director of this operation about how business has been going really well ever since a youngster helped them out, which confirms his suspicion that they have been receiving outside help. Later, he knocks out a couple of guards to get into a vault, and in it he finds a framed counterfeit bill, but it turns out to be a trap as an alarm is set off and he needs to move fast to get out of there. Back at the mansion, Mutsumi and Taiyo check her room to see if Kengo is hiding in there, but there are no abnormal thermal signatures, so the room is clear. Next up, they head over to Shin's room and she's busy playing a handstand game, but she says she hasn't seen Kengo pass through here recently, so they keep checking all the rooms in house until the only one left is Kyo's room. One of the paintings starts smiling, so it seems like Kengo is having fun playing hide and seek with them. Since they haven't found him yet, Taiyo wonders if he may have already made it outside, but Mutsumi is sure that there is no way to escape the lockdown. Just then, the others come over and ask what Taiyo and Mutsumi are doing, and Shein doesn't seem to have any memory of speaking with Taiyo, so they ask where everyone has been up till now. They say that they've been busy analyzing some drugs they seized from a cartel, and they just got back, meaning Kengo was disguised as all of them earlier. Just then, they notice that Tango has been disguised as the paintings behind them, and once they spot him, he starts hopping through the halls until he turns around the corner. Taiyo follows him, but gets knocked out as soon as he is out of sight. Mutsumi rushes over to check on him, and Taiyo looks like he is alright, but he says Kengo threw the painting at him, before diving into the hidden passageway in the wall. Mutsumi knows every single secret passage in the house, but she doesn't recognize this one, which means Kengo must have made it himself, while she wasn't looking. If he is the one who made it, then there's no way to find him now, so Mutsumi gives up and disables the lockdown. 
Taiyo suggests that they just look for the file in Kengo's room, but as they enter, Mutsumi handcuffs him because she realized that it was actually Kengo in disguise. She knows that under no circumstances would Kengo ever be able to make it out of the house during lockdown, which is why he would need her to turn it off for him to escape, which is why he hid Taiyo and disguised himself as him. But what gave him away is the fact that Taiyo always lets Mutsumi enter a room first when he opens the door for her, so he still got some work to do on his Taiyo impressions. Kengo gets sent back into a flashback of when he was younger and was first introduced to Mutsumi, and he is feeling a lot of emotion after seeing how much his sister has grown since then, so he takes off his disguise and admits defeat to her. Later, Taiyo is helping him look for the paperwork they need to find and Kengo apologizes for stuffing Taiyo on the wall earlier. He doesn't really mind since Mutsumi was having fun chasing Kengo around the house, so the two end up bonding. Meanwhile, Kiyo has just discovered that Mutsumi found out about his worship den and defaced one of the pictures, so he is pretty distraught about it. Later, Taiyo is trying some of the curry that Mutsumi had made that morning and it tastes delicious, but then she reveals that the secret ingredient is cyanide and he suddenly doesn't feel so good anymore. The phone suddenly rings, so Taiyo takes the opportunity to get up so he doesn't have to eat any more poisonous food, but when he gets to the phone, he sees that it's Shinzo's number calling and he is totally freaking out. Mutsumi comes over to check on him and puts the call on video display, but Shinzo can't calm down enough to tell her what's happening. After a little convincing, she finds out that Shinzo got into a firefight with the enemy, but there were a lot more people than he expected, so he ended up running out of ammunition. And without his weapons, he has nothing. Mutsumi explains that Shinzo is a weapons expert, but when he is unarmed, he becomes a total wimp, so she needs Taiyo to go save him. He agrees, and in a short amount of time, Taiyo is outside the counterfeit warehouse with a small package of weapons to help Shinzo regain his confidence. Mutsumi is going to help him navigate his way around the base while also keeping Shinzo from going into a panic attack, but she asks Taiyo not to do anything too dangerous. However, he almost immediately gets himself held at gunpoint. He panics a little, but then he remembers some things that Shinzo had taught him about how to handle a gun to the back of your head. Be warned, this does not work in real life, but for Taiyo, he jams his head into the gun, preventing it from firing at which point he grabs the guard's arm and knocks him out. He may have successfully taken down an enemy, but the noise alerted others of his presence so he needs to focus so he doesn't mess up. From the sound of their running, he can tell that there are three people armed with guns and knives, so as they turn the corner, he knees one in the face and then takes care of the other two, but he still needs to stop one last guy that is about to call for backup. He pulls out a special 8 million volt gun he was given by Shinzo that morning, and with it, he zaps the radio to stop any backup calls, and decks the last guy. A few minutes later, Taiyo has made it to the storage closet that Shinzo was hiding in, and Shinzo is really happy to see him, but he is even happier to have a gun again. Taiyo hates to interrupt the reunion, but he thinks they had better retreat before they get caught. However, it's too late as some guards already found them, but just when Taiyo was about to act, Shinzo steps up and disarms them all with his gun. He may be a wimp unarmed, but now that he's packing artillery, he's got a whole new level of confidence. He runs out the door and grabs one guy he uses a human shield while he takes down the rest of them. Taiyo is really impressed by how calm and efficient Shinzo is being right now, but they don't have any time to waste as they need to escape quickly. Mutsumi gives them directions to the nearest exit, but along the way, a sniper shoots Taiyo in the thigh, causing him to fall to the ground. Shinzo was about to return fire, but the sniper warned him not to do anything dumb because he could easily put another bullet in Taiyo's head right now. A shot straight through the thigh bleeds rapidly, so if Shinzo wants to save Taiyo from dying of blood loss, then he had better drop his gun immediately. Since he cares about Taiyo a lot, Shinzo drops his weapon. But since Mutsumi thought ahead for a scenario like this, she told Taiyo to arm Shinzo with the next best weapon available, a fork. In the hands of Shinzo, Almost anything becomes a deadly weapon, so he is able to throw the fork so fast that it destroys the sniper rifle, and with the time that bought him, he is able to pick his gun back up and shoot the sniper several times. After that whole mess is done with, Shinzo is carrying Taiyo home and apologizes to him for forcing him to come save him from his own mission, but Taiyo feels like he is the one who should be apologizing for getting hurt and slowing them down. Meanwhile, back at the counterfeit warehouse, another agent has arrived and is torturing the survivors to get them to give him info about who they work for. But he doesn't get the answers he wants, so he just finishes him off and pulls up his phone to find his next target, Taiyo. Late into the night, Taiyo is talking with Mutsumi on the phone as she is casually asking him out on a date. And while he would have obviously accepted, a car pulls up in front of him so he realizes that something is wrong and hangs up the call before this guy steps out. He asks to confirm that it is actually Taiyo, and after Taiyo answers him, he reaches into his pocket to pull out a badge and tells Taiyo that he is a police officer named Seiji, so he needs to ask him some questions. 
At the police station, Tayo is brought into a dark interrogation room, where the man tells him that he'll cut straight to the chase. He shows Tayo a video of him getting choked by one of the guards in the mission he just went on and says it was posted on the dark web, so Tayo is starting to panic since he's been busted. Seiji goes on to list a bunch of the other crimes he has evidence of Tayo committing, including unlawful use of a firearm, trespassing on private property, and domestic terrorism. Even Saul won't be able to clear him of these charges, so Taiyo is pretty disheartened, but the CG mentions that he finds it strange that he wasn't able to find anything about Taiyo's partners in crime because he knows there's no way a teenager would be able to pull all of this off without some form of assistance. So there must be some secret organization backing him. CG promises to let Taiyo off easy if he gives up information about this secret organization, so he now realizes why CG brought him here. He's looking for someone to snitch on the Yozakurta family and Taiyo is not a snitch, so he firmly says he doesn't know anything. CG sees Tayo as being difficult, so he offers him a glass of water, but he also brazenly drugs that glass of water before handing it to Tayo. Tayo was not an idiot, so he refuses to drink it, but CG tries to lie saying it's just some healthy minerals. When his deception fails, CG is forced to take drastic measures and force it down his throat, however, Tayo had countermeasures in place for something like this, so he was able to catch all of the drugged water inside a water balloon and spit it out, once he recovers, he tries to reiterate that he knows nothing about any secret organization. But then he mimeses Siji isn't in his seat anymore, and just then, he appears behind him and nearly uses a hammer to cave his skull in. Taiyo managed to dodge out of the way, but then he stumbles onto a garbage bag that seems to be leaking human-flavored jam, and he's starting to question if Siji is actually a police officer or not. Seiji calmly explains that the man in that bag was a drug dealer who has ruined the lives of countless people, however, he always managed to escape punishment for his crimes by using his wealth and connections, so he took it upon himself to bring down the crime boss. He may be a police officer, but he is under no obligation to protect those who break the law, right now Taiyo is no exception. It was at this moment that Taiyo noticed one of Kyo's threads nearby, so he realizes that this must either be some sort of test or Kyo is messing with him. So he buckles down and tells Seiji, that he would rather die than give up any information. Seiji commends him for his bravery, but he's still going to smack him with the hammer regardless. Before the hammer connects, Taiyo managed to free himself from Seiji's grip and roll away, causing him to strike the wall and reveal that Kyo has been hiding here the entire time. Seiji realizes the jig is up now that Kyo has been revealed, so when Taiyo asks for an explanation, Kyo explains that Seiji used to be a classmate of his, and they currently have a deal together, in exchange for the Yozakura family helping him out with his investigations, he covers up all the possibly illegal stuff the Yozakura family does. Steiji still finds Kyo to be exhausting whenever he is around, but as far as Taiyo goes, he tells him he passed his little tests since he didn't rat out his friends. Kyo is glad everything worked out, but since he is here anyway, Seiji wants his help with an investigation he is currently engaged with. However, Kyo doesn't want to have to deal with it now, so he makes up an excuse about having somewhere he needs to be, and says he'll be leaving now. Since there is nothing left to do here, CG asks Taiyo if he wants a ride back home, but he says he'll be fine. The next day at school, Taiyo is completely wiped since he didn't get to sleep at all last night. Mutsubi asks if he is alright, and he's about to explain everything that happened last night, but Kyo walks into the room, which is pretty unusual even if he has a persona as the vice principal here. He tells the class that their usual teacher is out sick today, so he will be acting as their substitute teacher for the day. As Kyo is teaching the class, Taiyo is finding it harder and harder to stay awake, so he thinks it would be alright to just have a little nap. But the second his eyes are closed, Kyo sends a piece of chalk flying his way so fast that if Taiyo had managed to dodge, that's what would have happened to his head. Kyo then starts using Morse code to talk to Taiyo and tell them that his spy must always be in a state of awareness of their surroundings. Dolphins and migratory birds are able to do this by only sleeping with half their brain at any given moment, and it's possible for humans to learn this power as well as long as the person trains hard enough. Kido, for example, managed to learn this at the age of 15, and he hasn't slept since then, but Taiyo complains that it's totally unreasonable. Kido says he'll be using his threads to keep an eye on Taiyo's heart rate, and if he happens to fall asleep at all during the class, then he'll be woken up by a piece of chalk traveling at the speed of sound in his direction. Taiyo can't believe he has to deal with training even at school, and Mutsui jumps in on the conversation as well to back him up since she knows Kyo is just doing this to mess with Taiyo. Taiyo is surprised she knows how to use Morse code as well, but it's natural for her since she has been part of the spy family her entire life. She tells Kyo to leave Taiyo alone while he's at school, but Taiyo stops her and says she doesn't have to worry because he can handle any kind of training Kyo throws at him. 
Kyo likes Taiyo's confidence, but he's going to make sure that it doesn't last long, so he pulls out a green pill, slams it on his desk, releasing a cloud of smoke into the classroom and effectively gassing everyone. Mutsubi manages to hold out since she's always prepared in case of gas attacks, although she never would have expected that she would have to use it to protect herself from Kyo. The pill they just crushed contained a special sleeping gas that Nano developed, so one whiff of this stuff will put most people to sleep. And that includes Taiyo as well. Now that he has fallen asleep, Kyo has all the freedom in the world to hit him with as many supersonic chalk attacks as he wants, but at the last second, Taiyo springs back up and blasts the chalk away with his Volt gun. Mutsumi is glad that he managed to stay awake after all, but that doesn't seem to be the case since Taiyo is actually out cold, but he has somehow awakened the ability to protect himself in his sleep. Kyo has to admit that he is impressed, but the training is far from over since he still needs to push Taiyo to his limits. He throws several pieces of chalk at him, and even though he's asleep, he is still managing to skillfully evade and counter the attacks. So much so that he is able to evenly match Kyo at every turn, but Mutsumi doesn't like how Taiyo is becoming a monster as well. That a while later, things settled down, but apparently Taiyo's state of sleep awareness was only temporary as he hasn't been able to replicate it since, and he has also had constant sleepwalking issues as well. The next day, Taiyo is busy reading a spy magazine which is detailing every single reason spy marriages often end in divorce. And the main cause is usually overworking to the point where the connection fades away. So to prevent this, when Mutsumi brings a cup of tea for Taiyo, he tries to ask her out on a date, but he is interrupted by a call from Seiji, since he needs Taiyo to help him on a mission. Taiyo doesn't really want to have to do this, but Seiji insists on it, so he reluctantly agrees and heads out to the mission location. Later, Taiyo has arrived at an amusement park and asks Seiji over the phone what he's supposed to be doing here. He gets briefed on the situation and is told that there is a couple in the park who are in possession of illegal guns, so he needs Taiyo to smoke them out. He still doesn't have much info on what the couple looks like, so Seiji tells Taiyo to stay on the lookout for any suspicious-looking people in the park. However, with everyone else having come as a couple, Taiyo is the one who looks most suspicious. While he is lamenting over how out of place he looks, Mutsumi comes up to him with a drink in hand to cheer him up. It takes a minute for Taiyo to realize that it's Mutsumi, but once it finally clicks that it's her, he starts asking how she even found this place to begin with. As for how she knew he was here, she just had to ask Seiji. But she also makes a point that being in the park as a couple would be a lot more natural for his mission. Taiyo tries to protest since this mission could be dangerous, but she tells Taiyo to keep his voice down since the targets could be nearby since there are all these suspicious couples around. And besides, she has enough training to defend herself and Taiyo is here to protect her if anything goes wrong, so she should be fine. Taiyo can't really argue with her logic, plus the people he's after aren't targeting Mutsumi in the first place, and most importantly, this will give Taiyo a chance to actually go on a date with Mutsumi and keep their marriage alive. One of the suspicious couples starts heading towards the roller coaster, so Mutsumi suggests they go after them for surveillance purposes. They end up getting on the roller coaster with a punk rock couple and a normal looking couple, and as the ride begins, everyone has their different reactions. The guy in front is freaking out, the lovey-dovey couple are enjoying themselves, and Mutsumi seems to be having fun, but Taiyo is just having a nap. After the ride is over, he apologizes to her for falling asleep when they were meant to be having fun, but after all the intensive training he had to go through, the roller coaster felt like a relaxing massage chair to him. Mutsumi tells him it's alright, but more importantly, she directs his attention to the couple they were following, and from the looks of it, they seem to be on a regular date, so they can't be the ones Taiyo is after. They decide to move on to the next suspects on the list, the bodybuilders. They all get on the next ride, and that lovey-dovey couple is here too. But Taiyo is so concerned with making sure Mutsumi is having fun that he turns the cup so hard that she can barely see anything. Meanwhile, the buff couple don't seem to be having any trouble with the centrifugal force and even take a moment to kiss each other. Taiyo is a little jealous of how well their date is going, but he now knows that they are just a casual gym enjoyer couple, meaning that there's just one suspicious couple left. The lovey-dovey duo are still here for some reason, but Taiyo is yet to find them suspicious, so he continues tailing the business couple, but then he spots a bouquet of flowers and that gets him thinking that he should get a gift from Mutsumi. Later, she and Taiyo are watching the business couple have a cup of coffee, but they don't seem like they are the gun-wielding suspects either, so Mutsumi gets up to go get some drinks for her and Taiyo. Just then, he notices that the lovey-dovey couple doesn't seem to be getting along so well anymore because they are both accusing each other of being cheaters, so they are going to settle things between themselves the American way. After they draw their guns, everyone in the store panics and runs out so they don't get caught in the crossfire and Mutsumi gets pushed out along with the crowd, so Taiyo is left in there by himself. He ducks under a table and finds a boy hiding there, scared for his life. 
But the line was crossed when one of the stray bullets hit the flower he was planning to give Mutsumi as a gift. So he jumped out and told the two gunslingers who somehow managed to miss every single shot they took to take their fight somewhere else. So he immediately zaps both of them with his Volk gun. With both of them down and out, Taiyo calls in Seiji to have them arrested and taken away, and Seiji is really thankful for the help Taiyo provided. Now that the mission is over, Taiyo and Mutsumi are finally able to enjoy their time in the park. Mutsumi wanted to do this because she had heard that couples who ride the Ferris wheel together and watch the sunset get a happily ever after. Now that Taiyo knows what this was about, he gains the courage to give Mutsumi the gift he had gotten for her, although it's a little damaged. She is stunned since she never expected Taiyo to be the kind of person to go for romantic gestures like this, but it makes her really happy. In a dark apartment, a girl is busy trying to hack her way into a secured system, and there's Sheen who just finished her final mission, she can finally sleep after 80 hours of work. But that doesn't last long because she gets an emergency alert on the screen saying that someone has breached the system, and she now needs to deal with a hacker who is messing with her system. The hacker gets locked out, but Sheen isn't done with her yet as she's going to make sure to ruin her computer as payback for forcing her to stay awake longer. The hacker panics after she loses control of her computer, but then she remembers that she can just unplug her computer so Sheen has no way of finding out who she is or counterhacking. After the girl is in the clear, she plugs her computer back in to take a look at the data she managed to steal, and it looks like she ended up getting exactly what she wanted from the system. The pictures of Taiyo so she may have an unhealthy obsession with him. The next morning, Taiyo and Mutsumi are on their way to school when they spot Shein who looks even more tired than normal. Mutsumi asks if she pulled another all-nighter again, and that much is obvious because she had to stay up and make sure the system couldn't get hacked again. Though the hacker seems to have only gone through Taiyo's files for some reason, but it's not like she managed to get any important information anyway, so Shein tells them that there's nothing to worry about. Besides, she has updated the security system, so there's no chance of a secondary breach, but she still doesn't know how anyone could have gotten through the old security system, since the only ones who know the passcode are the members of this family. Taiyo already knows this isn't going to end well, but there's nothing he can do about it right now. So he just goes to school with Mutsumi as usual. Just then, he notices something off, so he stops Mutsumi just in time to avoid several spikes that were thrown at them. And since there's imminent danger, Taiyo takes Mutsumi and runs off, the assailant, who also happens to be the same hacker from earlier, chases after him. Taiyo and Mutsumi keep running until they turn into an alleyway, at which point Taiyo turns around and draws his gun to counterattack his pursuer. The girl surprises him with an attack from above, but Taiyo is still able to counter and throw her back. The girl loves how strong Taiyo is in person and she straight up tells him that she's in love with him, and immediately after that, she asks him to die for her. Taiyo is confused, but Mutsumi seems to know exactly what's going on since she recognizes the girl. Her name is Ayaka, and she is well known in the underworld as the Manhunter Spy, although she does appreciate the name. She is called that because she has a reputation for using her spy techniques to follow men she has a crush on, and then shortly after she stabs them to death. This means that Ayaka has fallen in love with Taiyo, and she mentions that she became even more infatuated with Taiyo after his achievements became recognized, and he officially had his first bounty on his head. But it worries her a little since there are now a bunch of people trying to kill him for non-love related reasons, which she proves by taking out one of the assassins that had been after Taiyo. Since there's so much competition for his life, she wants to make sure she is the one to take out Taiyo so that no one else can have him. There are a lot of little things Taiyo does as well that make her like him even more, like how he tries not to ruin plants when he's infiltrating, or how he always repairs the damage he causes whenever he's on a mission. Taiyum doesn't know how she even managed to learn all this stuff about him, but Mutsumi agrees with Ayaka since she knows that Taiyo is totally lovable in every way imaginable. Ayaka beckons him to come to her so she can romantically stab him to death, but Taiyo slowly backs up and says he wants nothing to do with her since he is already married to Mutsumi, and frankly, even Bob the Builder wouldn't be able to fix that much crazy, so what chance does he have? Ayaka doesn't take the hint and thinks Mutsumi must have brainwashed Taiyo into marrying her, so she would love to take Mutsumi out right now and get rid of her rival, but Kiyo strictly forbade her from harming Mutsumi in any way. Both of them are surprised to find out that Kiyo is involved in this, so Ayaka explains that no one can target a member of the Yozakura family and survive while Kiyo is around, so she went to him in the slight hope that he would allow her to kill Taiyo, and to her surprise, he said she can do whatever she wants with him as long as Mutsumi stays safe. And since Kiyo was feeling so generous, Ayaka also asked if she could take a look at Taiyo's personal files as well, so Kiyo just gave her the access code to the system. But even with all the prep material Kiyo got for her, this attack failed, so she decides to leave for now and come back later, but not before displaying her needle-throwing capabilities. 
Later that day, Ayaka manages to weasel her way into Tayo's school as a transfer student, and by sheer coincidence, she gets assigned this seat right next to Tayo. As she is walking over to her desk, she pretends to trip over and launches a spike straight at Tayo's face, but he was able to block it with his notebook just in time. And this was only the beginning of Tayo's ordeal with Ayaka, because throughout the rest of the day, she continuously attempts to catch him off guard and stab him. But by third period, Tayo has pretty much gotten used to it, so he can dodge the needles with little effort, and by this point, her needles are nothing more than a slight inconvenience to his daily routine. Ayaka is crying her eyes out over Tayo refusing to get stabbed, but she is still delusional, so she decided to step things up and throws needles into the necks of everyone in the class, causing them to all stand up in unison. Tayo was wondering what Ayaka just did, so she explains that she just used her needles to inject the students with mind control poison, so they'll do anything she says now. She orders them all to subdue Tayo because she knows he isn't going to fight back against regular people, and Tayo is eventually completely surrounded. Tayo tells her it isn't fair to involve innocent people in her little schemes, but she's too crazy to listen to reason, so Mutsui has to use herself as a human shield in order to stop Ayaka. However, while Ayaka was distracted, the guy she struck with needles before comes back for revenge against her and fires a gun to kill her. Fortunately, Mutsumi is faster than bullets, and is able to push Ayaka out of the way because her life is precious, even if she's trying to kill Tayo. But the guy gets no such mercy because Tayo immediately electrocutes him until he falls out the window of the third floor. Now that he is taken care of, Tayo rushes over to Mutsumi to see if she is alright, and Ayaka is left wondering why Mutsumi would risk her life to save someone who is trying to steal her husband. Mutsumi answers that she just didn't want someone who can appreciate Tayo's charms just like she can to die for no reason, and that single act of kindness was enough for Ayaka to switch teams because she's now into girls, specifically Mutsumi. After school, Tayo is glad that he doesn't have to worry about Ayaka trying to stab him anymore, but he also finds it a little annoying how she's trying to steal his wife now. He asks Mutsumi how she is handling all of Ayaka's clinginess, but she has had to deal with Kyo for years, so Ayaka is a lot easier to manage. Meanwhile, Tayo receives a call from Shin, and a while later, he has been roped into joining her for a video game session. Mutsumi explains that Shin drags one of the family members into her room every once in a while to join her in her sleep-deprived work. Last time, she got Shinzo to join her, and he didn't get to sleep for five days straight because of it, but Mutsumi assured him that she'll be here on standby in case his heart gives out from too many energy drinks. Taiyo is a little worried about what he may be getting himself into, so Shin tells him that there's no need to worry because this will just be a trial run for him, so it shouldn't be anything too difficult. It's a simple game with simple rules. When an enemy shows up on screen, you have to defeat it. The game seems simple enough, so Taiyo is able to keep up with Shin. But then she says they'll be going up against a final boss, so they need to stop the train in its tracks. She warns Taiyo that a terribly realistic cutscenes will play if they don't manage to stop it, and Taiyo wants to avoid seeing something like that as much as possible, so he furiously mashes the buttons until they successfully stop the train. And in unrelated news, a runaway train has just managed to stop, but no one knows how it happened. Taiyo realizes that the game must have been controlling the train, and Shin confirms it, telling him that this is how she completes her missions. She converts them into games and plays them to finish. The reason she brought Tayo to join her today is because she has a mission to complete, and it would have been a hassle to complete it on her own. Some protesters are taking things too far, so they need to stop them before they can crash a helicopter into a thermal power plant. They just need to stop the figurative dragon before it can do any damage, so after briefing Tayo on the objective, Shein starts the mission. She is skillfully destroying tons of the little attackers, but on Tayo's end, he still hasn't figured out the controls yet. So he runs into a dead end and keeps trying to run through it. Shin tells Tayo he sucks at video games and a spy needs to have this kind of skill, but then Tayo just gets through the wall anyway. He doesn't know how he managed it, but he has activated the no-clip glitch, as well as the invincibility glitch, so there's no way he's losing now. However, Shin is pissed because only cowards use glitches to beat games. Mutsui tells her to focus on the game because the helicopter is getting close to destroying the plant, Shin decides to show off her game skills and dashes through the horde of minions before closing in on the helicopter and knocking it down. However, even though the initial goal has been accomplished, the game isn't over yet as there are still tons of smaller ones heading their way. It seems the protesters called in a bunch of drone strikes and Shin isn't prepared to handle this on her own. So she starts calling up Shinzo to ask him to get the missiles ready, but Taiyo doesn't think they'll need to go that far because he has an idea. He has Shein take over the systems of the helicopter she just took down and with it, they are able to destroy tons of drones at a time. It was a brilliant idea on Tayo's part, but if the Tayo stops pressing buttons for even a second, the helicopter is going to crash. 
A couple of the drones managed to slip past them, and it looks like they were about to destroy the power plant. But out of nowhere, Ayaka's avatar jumps in and stops them. Ayaka hacked her way into the system again, but she just wanted to steal more of Tayo's pictures and some of Mustumi as well, which is when she somehow ended up here. And she's being a huge help, albeit unintentionally, so Shin decides to ignore her and push forward to complete the mission. After some more blasting, they eventually take out the last drone, so Tayo breathes a sigh of relief, and Shein had a good amount of fun with it. Ayaka also feels relieved even though she doesn't know what just happened, but now that the mission is over, Shin locks her out of the system again. Shin congratulates Tayo on doing so well with his first virtual mission, but she wants to show him that he can't do everything with glitches, so she's not letting him leave this room until he has learned how to play games the right way. And that led to three days straight without sleep, so Tayo is in terrible condition right now. A while later, we see two spies who just got done with one of their missions, and one of them who is called was Oga is taking a break and reading the latest issue of Spies Monthly, which has put Tayo on the front cover. Oga is really impressed with all of Tayo's achievements, but his partner, Sui refuses to show interest in anything that does not involve their missions. Meanwhile, back at the Yozakura mansion, Tayo receives a call from Nano, who wants to know if Tayo is free to come pick him up since he needs a ride home. Tayo was in the middle of his workout warm-up, but he agrees to help him out and asks where he is right now. Nano explains that he is at the evil laboratory. Tayo needs a little more clarification, so Nano explains that there's a lab which was secretly developing bioweapons like toxic gas, so Nano was tasked with infiltrating the lab and putting a stop to it. He was successful, so he now has possession of the germ bomb called Sodom. If it were to go off, then it would wipe out all life within a 10-kilometer radius, and it is obviously really dangerous to bring something like this outside, so Nano just decides to eat it instead. Tayo is concerned that Nano just ate a bioweapon, but he explains that his body is really, really good at detoxifying things, so it won't be able to kill him. However, it'll take him about three hours to finish neutralizing the toxic gas in his body, and while he's doing that, his body is going to get really sleepy as a side effect of the gas. He already put everyone in this lab to sleep, so there's no immediate danger, but he wants Tayo to come get him before the people from the other lab realize something is wrong and find him. Tayo understands what he needs to do, so he suits up and gets ready to head to the lab, but as he gets there, he finds it odd that he was able to get in here so easily. He keeps his guard up as he checks around each corner, but there are still no signs of any security whatsoever. That is until Tayo comes across the bodies of the security guards, and he's starting to get an even weirder feeling about this place. The guards have already been taken out, and the security system has been breached. But this isn't the kind of thing Mano would choose to do, so he wonders who's responsible for this. He gets a little distracted while thinking, so one of the guards who wasn't knocked out aims his gun at Tayo. But before he can fire, the guard gets knocked into a wall by a ball and chain. And the ones who saved him are none other than Sui and Oga from earlier. Sui is surprised that Tayo happens to be on a mission here as well, so he introduces both himself and Oga as part of Hinajuku, which means they are government spies. Tayo has heard all about Hinajuku, since unlike the Yozakura family which are freelance spies, the Hinajuku are elite spies who take orders directly from the government. Studi says they were sent here to neutralize this lab, and asks Oga for a status update, so Oga begins listening and he can hear the footsteps of five people across the building, but that's not all as he can literally smell their guns so he knows they are armed. That information lets Sui know that the base lab they are looking for must be underground after all, so he says goodbye to Tayo so they can accomplish their respective missions, but Oga isn't letting the chance to team up with Tayo slip past him, so he grabs Tayo and drags him along. A guard manages to sneak up on Tayo and fire two shots at him, but he is able to dodge both of them and counterattack, which Oga finds really impressive. They eventually arrive at the lab in question, and Tayo immediately rushes to aid Nano as soon as he spots him. However, Oga then tries to kill Nano with his steel ball, so Tayo is forced to block with his knife, breaking it in the process. Oga tells Tayo to get out of the way since it's dangerous for him to interfere like this. Their mission is to neutralize this laboratory, so Tayo doesn't understand why they would also want to kill Nano. So he explains that they had been monitoring this lab for a while, so they knew all about Nano infiltrating this place, and since Tayo knew his location, it made it easy for them to find this place. But since Nano has ingested the bioweapon, he has now become a huge threat to national security, so they need to eliminate him to complete their mission. Sui so then asks Tayo to step aside so he can kill Nano. But there's no way Tayo is ever going to sit back and watch his brother-in-law die. So Tayo gets in front of him and declares that if Oga and Su want to kill Nano, then they are going to have to get through him first. He is ready to fire at them and Oga tries to warn him to reconsider. 
But it's already too late as Su has already activated his Sand Vistan and dashes past Taiyo with his sword, while slicing up Taiyo's gun and body in the process. He probably could have already killed Nanao by now. But he wanted to prove a point about how Taiyo's emotions are nothing but weakness. He was so trusting that he let his guard down around spies he has never met before and so lax that he hesitated to shoot at them first. Ova complains that Sui always acts like this, so he was about to try and stop him, but then he remembers that Sui is way too powerful for him to beat, so he stands down. Sui walks over to Nanao and promises that he will make the death as painless as possible, but Taiyo still pleads with him not to do this. Sui calls Taiyo pathetic for thinking he could solve his problems by just asking nicely, but before he finishes the job, Nanao finally wakes up and tells Sui to wait a minute. He explains that his body has just finished detoxifying the gas, and he has a patch test as proof of that. He doesn't care if Sui still intends to kill him regardless, but he at least wants to be able to treat Taiyo's wounds before he ends up dying due to blood loss. Sui stops and puts his sword away since he has no reason to kill Nanao if he has actually detoxified the poison. He says he'll take the latch test as documentation that his mission was successful. And before he walks away, he hands Nano some cream that heals slash wounds so he can treat Taiyo. Although if Taiyo is actually this weak, then he thinks it might be better for the Yozakura family Taiyo to actually die. Sui and Oga then leave and Nano frantically tries to treat Taiyo's wounds so that he doesn't die. Once Taiyo has recovered, he finds himself being held captive over a flame by Kyo, and he has no idea why. Kyo shows Taiyo that he made it to the front page of the spy magazine again, but this time it's talking all about how Taiyo got his ass handed to him by Hinajiku spies, even going as far as to call it the downfall of the Yozakura family. So Kyo is pretty pissed about it and is going to go hunt down the journalist that wrote this article later. But for now, he blames Taiyo for all the bad press the Yozakura family is getting, even though a large chunk of it is because of Kyo's actions. However, what makes him the most mad is the fact that Taiyo nearly caused Nano to be killed due to his own weakness. If anyone, Kyo would have much preferred that Sui killed Taiyo, but Nano and Mutsumi soon show up and put a stop to Kyo's bullying. Mutsumi then goes to free Taiyo from his binds, but once he can finally talk again, he says he doesn't blame Kyo for being mad at him since it is actually true that he has tarnished the Yozakura family name. Nano tries to tell him that Taiyo is the only reason he managed to avoid being killed, but Taiyo doesn't see it that way since he couldn't do anything other than buy a few extra seconds against Sui because he is so weak. Kiyo then walks up to him and spins him around, telling him that he could never do anything significant enough to shake the Yozakura family. But if he really wants to take responsibility for his loss, then the only thing he needs to do is get stronger and go get revenge against Sui. Sui is currently standing on a train and tells a guy to move, but the guy doesn't want to budge since his legs are long, and there are plenty more space for Sui, but Sui takes it personally and shreds the man's clothes. After which he walks away to find another spot anyway, and after he is settled in, he finally addresses something that has been bugging him for a while and asks Taiyo what exactly he thinks he is doing with that obviously suspicious disguise. Taiyo realizes he has been found out and Sui asks if he's here to try and get revenge for the last fight they had. But that's not what Taiyo is here for. Earlier, Kyo explained that Hinajiku spies all have unique skills, and in a battle between spies, if Taiyo wants to beat them, then he's going to need to steal as much info as he can about their abilities. Which is why Taiyo tells Sui that he's going to learn everything that he lacks as a spy by watching Sui. This is the first time Sui has ever heard someone announce that they intend to spy on him, but he has no objections and says Taiyo can do whatever he wants. But it's not like he believes Taiyo will be able to keep up with him and his Sandivistan. Taiyo was having trouble keeping up with Sui and remembers what Kyo had told him about the Hinajiku moving technique. It's their secret method of walking silently at high speed, so it helps them in infiltration, tailing, and combat. As one of the squad leaders at Hinajiku, Sui is particularly skilled at this technique, so Taiyo would have a hard time noticing him. But even so, Taiyo must do everything in his power to keep track of him. However, Sui gets annoyed when Taiyo starts keeping up with him, so he uses his sword to shred all of Taiyo's clothes and leave him to be arrested by the station police. But Taiyo still refuses to give up, so the next day, while Sui and Oga were out on one of their missions, Taiyo was tailing behind and Sui is fed up again. So he shreds his clothes again. On day three, Sui and Oga were hanging off the side of a building to have their lunch and Taiyo is still behind them, so Sui slashes his clothes off once more. By the time a week has passed, Sui and Oga are on another mission and Taiyo is helping them out since he's still following him. Oga is still a fan of Taiyo and is impressed with how much he has improved over the week, but Sui doesn't care and moves in to slash off Taiyo's clothes off again. But this time, 
Taiyo manages to dodge enough to save his pants from getting slashed and Sui is starting to realize that Taiyo may actually be getting better, but he still slashes off the rest of his clothes again. Later that day, Nano walks into the kitchen and finds Kyo preparing dinner, so he asks if he has seen Taiyo anywhere, and Kyo answers that he found him collapsed by the door, probably because he lost his suit again. But when Nano asks if that means he carried him up to his room, Kyo reveals that he is currently using Taiyo's body as a cutting board. Nano pushes Kyo out of the way and checks on Taiyo to see if he is alright, but he just laughs and says Sui got him again. Nano doesn't understand why Taiyo would be pushing himself so hard to follow Sui around, but Taiyo believes he needs to do this to overcome his weakness. He nearly let Nano die and he's sure that no one would want a big brother as lame as him. Nano doesn't see it that way since from day one, Taiyo has always been doing things that no one would expect of him. So no matter what anyone says, Taiyo is always going to be cool in his eyes. On the 10th day of Taiyo following Sui, he has managed to tail him for the entire day, so Sui is indeed impressed, but he is done playing around with Taiyo, so he plans to finish him off once and for all this time. However, this time as Sui prepares to strike him, Taiyo knows the attack is coming, so he is able to grab his arm, although he still gets slashed in the process. After getting hit so many times by Sui's blade, Taiyo has realized that whole the slashes are spread all around his body, and the first one always starts from the center. He still can't see the attacks coming or react to them, but this way, he can at least survive Sui's attacks. He throws Sui across the yard, and he now understands why Taiyo was able to become a part of the Yozakura family, so he won't try to get rid of him anymore. He calls for Oga to help treat Taiyo's wounds, so Oga comes out of his hiding place and starts patching Taiyo up. He can't believe that Taiyo actually managed to dodge Sui's sword, but Sui knew he didn't actually dodge it, all he did was memorize Sui's habits so he would know when the attack was coming, but even that is still quite impressive. In the end, the article about Taiyo getting beaten ended up being forgotten, but Taiyo still has a lot to deal with since there are now articles of him being naked all over town, and people think he's a weirdo now. Sometime later, a party is being held by some extravagant politicians, and the Hanajuku spies were meant to do something about it, but they failed their mission. The spies apologize to their manager for not completing their mission, but the politicians have been on high alert recently, so it is really difficult to get through since security has been really tight lately. The manager had expected as much, but she was not worried since she has the perfect plan to get through their security, and it was going to involve Taiyo. The next day, Taiyo is out in the park with Mutsumi, and he's happy to spend time with her since she asked for his help with an errand, but he is a little curious about what she needs to do that requires all this stuff in his backpack. Eventually, they meet up with an old friend of Mutsumi's, and it turns out to be Sui, so Taiyo is reasonably shocked. Mutsumi explains that she knows Sui because they have worked together before, but even with that being the case, she's still a little pissed at him for the whole nearly killing Taiyo and Nano thing that happened. Sui doesn't expect her to forgive him, but he also isn't sorry about it since he was just fulfilling a mission. He then asks that they hurry up since his leader is currently waiting for them to arrive. A little while later, they arrive at this huge office building, but that doesn't really matter because the real Hinajiku base is the cafe beside it. They all lock in and Sui goes up to the register to place his really long order. And once he's done, a code is entered into the register which opens a trap door beneath their feet. Taiyo is a bit surprised, but Sui says it's only natural the secret government spy organization be located underground. There'll be another few hundred more meters before they make it to the head office, so Sui offers Mutsumi some tea while she's sitting in his lap, and Taiyo really doesn't approve since she is his wife. However, Sui states that it would be too dangerous to let her go by herself, so he is just keeping her safe for now. And Taiyo sees exactly what he means by that as hundreds of arrows and lasers begin flying in their direction. These are inbuilt traps for the Hinajiku base's security and spy training, so Taiyo shouldn't let his guard down, otherwise he'll be ground beef before they reach the floor. After several torturous seconds of dodging lasers, Sui and Taiyo finally make it to the ground floor, but the traps aren't over yet, as a giant rock comes falling right on top of Taiyo. But just before he could be crushed, the Hinajiku leader runs forward and shatters the entire thing with just one punch. Afterward, she welcomes him and Mutsumi, but she wonders if Mr. Yozakura over here is really strong enough to keep Mutsumi safe at all. They all get settled down to have their meeting, and we see the leader binging on the delicious sweets that Mutsumi had Taiyo carry all the way here, and she is really grateful for it. She and Mutsumi seem to have a really good relationship, so Mutsumi explains that Rin was classmates with Kyo, so she throws tea parties with the family from time to time. Rin doesn't like hearing Kyo's name because talking about that sister-obsessed lunatic will ruin the taste of her cake, although she also understands how adorable Mutsumi is, which is why she wanted Mutsumi to marry someone who would be capable of protecting her from Kyo's antics, but looking at Taiyo, he's not going to cut it. 
She heard from Sui that Taiyo was a shitty spy, but Sui corrects her and explains that all he said was that Taiyo was really, really bad at anything spy related. Which is pretty much the same thing. Mutsumi stands up for her husband and says he's got just as much willpower as Kyo. So Rin accepts it as fact, but before they can carry on with the discussion, they are interrupted once Kyo breaks into the base. He had lost signal from the GPS tracker he has on Mutsumi, and he knew the only ones capable of disabling his tracker would be the Hinajiku spies, so he immediately came down here to retrieve her. Mutsumi already knows what is about to happen, as Rin gets up to face Kyo and tells him to leave immediately because his mere presence is polluting the air. Kyo refuses to let anyone spend time with Mutsumi aside from him, so uses his wires to attack her. However, Rin is on the same level as him, so she is able to punch straight through his wires and mocks him for trying to beat her with such a weak attack, so Kyo steps things up as the two clash. Their fight is enough to cause major damage to the base within seconds, so an evacuation order is issued for the safety of all the spies here. This is exactly what Mutsumi didn't want to happen, but everything Kyo and Rin are near each other, they always end up fighting. Sui attempts to stop the two of them, but he's way too weak to even get close to them. Mutsumi gets between Rin and Kyo and tells them to stop, but while they would both listen to her, they were too deep into the attack animation to cancel, so Mutsumi is in serious danger right now. Fortunately, Taiyo manages to pull her head down before she gets her jaw caved in, but he wasn't able to save himself though. He gets knocked out and Mutsumi is furious, so she threatens to never speak to either Rin or Kyo ever again if they continue causing trouble like this. At the thought of losing Mutsumi, Kiyo goes unconscious and Rin begins pleading for forgiveness. But on a side note, she has to admit that Taiyo is a lot tougher than she thought he would be since he was able to survive a direct hit from both her and Kiyo. Her opinion of him has improved, so she asks to discuss something with him when he regains feeling in his face. She wants Taiyo to go undercover to spy on a politician. He has provided free education, normalized pensions, and reduced consumer tax, so the people absolutely love him. But Rin says a lot of his achievements were built upon a lot of bloodshed. He has three of the most dangerous spies in the world, red, blue, and yellow. All is his right-hand men who help him with his bribery, assassinations, and every other illegal trick possible to gain public favor. And with the next general election coming up, he's going to be planning something big. He has skillfully managed to play off all his other crimes as coincidences up till now, but they recently found one of his miniature bombs in an unrelated case the other day, and though it may be small, it is still enough to kill a person up close. There are hundreds of these things at large, but even the bomb smuggler that they arrested doesn't know anything about what they'll be used for. The only clue they have is a video of the buyer in a wig and sunglasses, which looks exactly like the politician in question, but there's not enough evidence to get him arrested yet. So they need Taiyo to get close to him so they can get the evidence they need before people end up getting hurt. Taiyo asks why they are trusting him with this mission. So Rin explains that Kuroiri is originally from Japan, so he is aware of the existence of the Hinajiku spy organization and has his guard up. Which is why they need Taiyo to disguise himself as a girl to get in. Taiyo understands the assignment, but he doesn't understand why he needs to be dressed as a girl for it. So Rin shows him a job poster Kuroyera put out for a girl with black hair, and that's exactly what they need Taiyo to look like. But before they get the mission started, Rin reminds Taiyo that the fate of hundreds of lives rest in his hands, so he had better not screw up. Taiyo successfully gets hired, and at the next rally, he is introduced by Kuroyeri to his fans under the name Yoko Asada, but Taiyo really just wants to go home. A moment later, some people who are opposed to Kuroyeri's policies arrive, and they claim that everything he has done has only widened the gap between the rich and the poor, so a riot breaks out due to the protest. In all the commotion, a speaker nearly falls on a man, but before he can be injured. Kuroyeri runs out in front of him and takes the hit instead. He apologizes if they may have thought he had ulterior motives, but he says he really only holds the purest of intentions at heart. Even if they are against him, they still represent the voice of the people, so Kuroyeri is willing to listen to their grievances peacefully, so the protesters now suddenly don't hate him anymore. And everyone clapped. Kuroyeri is taken away in an ambulance for his injuries, so he tells Taiyo to head back to the office without him. In the ambulance, though, it is revealed that he isn't hurt at all. The whole thing was just part of his plot to get the public to approve of him more, and it absolutely worked as intended. Even his injuries were apparently fake as well, so after praising his wonderfully corrupt spies, he asks to see his new approval ratings, and as expected, they are going through the roof. But while he is celebrating, we see that Taiyo was hiding here all along, so he now has confirmation that Kuroyeri is as evil as can be. And there's no way he is going to let him get away with it. But even with that said, it was almost impossible for Taiyo to find anything related to their crimes. Kuroyuri and the triplets show up behind him as he is looking through their documents, so when he is asked what he's doing over there, he makes up an excuse about just wanting to organize things a bit. 
And realistically, organizing was all he was able to do, because no matter how hard he tried, he was never able to find any evidence of their crimes. And all this is in spite of them, them committing several crimes right in front of him. And with the bomb threat still ever present, he has still not found a single clue. Taiyo is really confused how they could be pulling all this off when he watches them every hour of the day and not once has he seen them so much as start evil laughing for their many crimes. And all they do is dance all day even though they completely suck at dancing. However, after taking a closer look, Taiyo realizes that their ridiculous moves aren't entirely because they are terrible dancers, but rather, they are using it to disguise a code they use to communicate with one another. Once he picks up on what their code is, is able to figure out that they are talking about how they just caused the downfall of an opposing organization. The next day, while a lot of important people are gathered in an auditorium, the plan Kuroyuri had was to use the bombs here because a lot of the people whom he couldn't use his dirty tricks on are gathered in one place, so he plans to get rid of them all today by planting the bombs under the stage. Without further delay, he presses the button to set off the bombs, but while the explosion does occur, it actually happens outside in the fountain. Taeyo is relieved that no one was hurt since he didn't have enough time to disarm the bombs and just chuck them in the fountain to minimize the explosive radius. He thinks he has managed to stop Kuroyuri's plans, but Kuroyuri already figured out that his assistant must be a spy since there should have been no way anyone would know about the bombs, so he points his gun at Taeyo and tells him he still has some backup bombs just in case something like this happened. He then shoots Taeyo in the head and sets off his secondary bombs, but while these ones go off as intended, all the people Kuroyuri wanted to kill are still alive somehow. They were all coated in some anti-shock foam before they could get hurt. And this was the work of Taiyo. He managed to stay alive since he switched the bullets in Kuroyuri's gun for fake ones, but he is still outnumbered 4 to 1, so Kuroyuri is still confident in his ability to get out of this as long as he has the triplets with him. However, Taiyo was never alone to begin with, as Su dashes past them all and slices their guns to pieces. As soon as it became clear that they were going to lose, the triplets ditch Kuroyuri before he even realized what was going on, and he is upset because he paid them top dollar to stick by his side. He still tries to put up a fight, but as a regular scummy person, he stands no chance against Sui. Now that everything is taken care of, Hinajuku arrives to handle the crime scene, so Sui asks Taiyo to escort Kuroyuri to the Hinajuku headquarters so he can be handed over to Rin. Taiyo still doesn't like being around Kuroyuri since he is really weird, but then he starts talking about how it is impressive that Taiyo overcame the trauma of the accident that killed his family and proved himself to become one of the Yozakuras. But it is truly unfortunate that he still believes what happened to his family was really an accident. This gets Taiyo's attention, so Kuroyuri goes on to say that he knows all about how his entire family crashed their car when they fell off a cliff, and the only one who survived was Taiyo. One could say that it was a miracle, but miracles can sometimes be the work of man. Hearing all this has made Taiyo really curious, so he points his gun at Kuroyuri's head and tells him to start talking because he wants to hear everything Kuroyuri knows about what happened to his family. Kuroyuri doesn't feel threatened by the gun, so he isn't obligated to answer any of Taiyo's questions, but as someone who is very familiar with the spy underworld, he can tell Taiyo with certainly that there are many hidden truths in the world. Just then, Taiyo receives a call from Sui, and it's an emergency. The deputy prime minister has been kidnapped and is being live-streamed from an unknown location. He was taken during all the chaos from the explosion and switched with a placeholder so his disappearance wouldn't be noticed. He must have been the target all along, so Sui wants Taiyo to interrogate Kuroyuri to find out what he knows about it. Evidently, Kuroyuri is well informed about the kidnapping and was even planning to head over to the abduction site, so he frees himself from his binds, which surprises Taiyo, and in the next moment he drops one of his earrings, causing a massive explosion in the middle of the road. Back at home, Nano is busy mixing up some chemicals when he accidentally messes up a little. An explosion occurs and Mutsumi rushes in to check on him. But there's no need to worry since there are no adverse effects aside from the stage 7 cancer he just got, but that's easy enough to fix. In a few minutes, Nanao has gotten rid of his tumors and goes back to mixing work. He explains to Mutsumi that he has been messing up lately because he is so worried about Taiyo possibly getting hurt on a mission, so he's finding it hard to focus on his work. That's what led him to begin his latest experiment, so in case Taiyo ever actually does come back as a mangled corpse, He'll have a concoction ready to heal him up. He asks Mutsumi if she isn't worried about Taiyo as well, but of course is worried about him. He's her husband. However, she also knows that brooding over it isn't going to help, so all she can do is prepare a celebratory feast for him when he returns. She may have went a little overboard with the cooking, but she's sure Taiyo will love it when he gets home. But now that she thinks about it, the house has been awfully quiet lately. So she asks Nano what everyone else is up to. 
Nanao explains that they are all worried as well, so Kengbo is busy making a mask for Taiyo in case his face gets disfigured beyond recognition during his mission. Shin is busy doxing all of Taiyo's haters on the internet and Shinzo has just been crying over it this entire time. However, neither Kiyo nor Futaba have moved a muscle, and it's because Futaba believes that there's no point in worrying about Taiyo since his skills are sufficient for a mission like this. Meanwhile, Kido isn't worried because he just never liked Taiyo to begin with. Back on the streets, Taiyo finally makes it out of the wreckage while carrying the driver, and the only thing on his mind right now is what Kuroeri had told him. If it is really true that his family's deaths weren't an accident, then who was behind it? Just then, he gets a call from Sui who asks if he is alright. Taiyo confirms that he managed to make it out in one piece with the driver, but Kuroeri managed to escape. Sui says that's not a problem since they expected this to happen in the first place. He didn't inform Taiyo of this earlier, but Kuroeri isn't just a crazy politician, he is actually a former spy known as Kurogo, and during his prime, he was a living legend. The official story is that he died six years ago, but as Taiyo has seen, he is still alive and well, under the new name Kuroeri. They eased the security on him during transport by only sending Taiyo so that he would be able to escape and they could figure out what his real objective is. And since they now know that he is heading for the place where the deputy prime minister is being held hostage, they should be able to find him with the GPS tracker they planted on his body. There's nothing more for Taiyo to do, so Sui tells him that he is free to return to headquarters. But what Kuroyuri had told him earlier still doesn't sit right with him, so he has a choice to make. At the undisclosed location, Kuroyuri takes the blindfold off the deputy prime minister who is confused by the whole situation. Kuroyuri tells him to just relax and look into the camera since the media is probably in an uproar already. The deputy is disappointed to find out that this is what Kuroyuri really is, he always thought he was an odd politician with that chicken costume, but finding out that he is a terrorist is simply disheartening. He tells Kuroyuri that a stunt like this won't be able to change the political climate, but Kuroyuri does give a damn about the political climate. The deputy is confused, so Kuroyuri finally decides to take off the rest of his disguise to enlighten the deputy on what's going to happen. As the waving glasses come off, the deputy's eyes go wide since he recognizes Kurogo, but it shouldn't be possible for him to be standing here since the deputy watched him die years ago. Now that introductions are out of the way, he sits down and addresses the public. He will not be speaking as Kuroyuri anymore, but as a father who lost his child. In his quest to avenge his child, he has taken out several politicians behind the scenes, but since the deputy is the one who knows the whole story, Kurogo thought it would be fitting to kill him in broad daylight. Now the interview begins. He points a gun at the deputy and tells him he has two choices. He can either confess to his crimes on national television and have his perfect image die, or he can refuse to tell the truth and die physically instead. The deputy smiles, but in the end, he is a politician, so there's no way he's got to tell the truth even if it means taking a bullet to the brain. Kurt Ogao expected that response, so he prepares to shoot him. But at the last second, the stream gets cut off. The phone that was being used as a camera was shot by Taiyo, who managed to track Kurogo here. He points his gun at him and tells Kurogo to let the deputy go, but Kurogo calls his bluff on this one. The electric grounds in that gun would be guaranteed to hit the deputy, as well if Taiyo fired now, so he knows Taiyo won't pull the trigger. Kurogo then fires his gun to knock Taiyo's gun out of his hand, but in that moment, he remembers the training he received from Futaba and begins moving to close the distance. Once he is close enough, he grabs Kurogo, but Kurogo recognizes the Yozakura Jujitsu technique and knows exactly how to counter it. He also knows about the special steel and carbon fire wires that the Yozakura family uses, so he takes Taiyo's wires for himself. Taiyo is confused about how Kurogo could possibly know how to use and counter the Yozakura family's secret techniques, so Kurogo explains that it is natural for him to be well-versed in gathering information since he is a spy, but as the only thing a spy can do is gather information, then they are just second-rate at best, so the truly skilled spies know how to fully exploit that information. Taiyo asks why a spy like Kurogo would become a politician just to deceive the people, but as he stated earlier, Kurogo has no interest in politics whatsoever. The only reason he went through all this effort is to get his revenge. Thanks to his ability to gather and exploit information, Kurogo was a valued spy in the world of politics, and on one day in particular, he had just finished one of his missions and was instructed to lay low until he is given his next directive, so he headed home to his daughter to surprise her for her birthday. At first, his daughter called Kurogo a weirdo for putting on a chicken costume, but she was just messing with him since she knew he did it to make her happy. Kurogo was always busy on his business trips, so she appreciates him taking the time to come home for her birthday party, and she's since excited to spend the day with him. But she also tells him that if he plans on surprising her, then he shouldn't send her a present before he gets home because it ruins the surprise. 
The only problem is, Kurogo never sent a present, so he immediately realizes that it must be a bomb, but it was already too late. The explosion went off, and while Kurogo was able to survive, his daughter did not. The organization he worked for had gotten their use out of him, so they attempted to erase him. Kurogo has murdered hundreds of people, so he's not going to claim to be a morally upstanding person, but they took his daughter away from him, so he vowed to make sure every last person involved pays for what they did. That is why he faked his death and reinvented himself as Kuroyuri. All so that he could get close to the other politicians who he was targeting to take them out. And now, Deputy Shirasagi is the last one standing but not for long. Taiyo tries to intervene to stop Kurogo from pulling the trigger, but he is pushed back by the triplets who never really abandoned him. At this point, Kurogo thinks it is pretty clear that Taiyo stands no chance against the four of them, so he tells Taiyo to stand down and let him get his revenge. Taiyo has also experienced what it is like to have his family taken away from him, so Kurogo would rather not have to hurt him. If Taiyo agrees to step back, then Kurogo is willing to tell him everything that he wants to know about what happened to his family. Taiyo understands how Kurogo feels about losing his family, and if there is really some kind of hidden secret regarding the accident that killed his family, then Taiyo wants to hear about it too. But above all, he doesn't want anyone to die, so he can't let Kurogo pull that trigger. Just then, Sui shows up and with a swing of his sword, he dices up the floor, sending himself and the triplets fall into the floor below. And as he falls, he says that he'll take care of the triplets down here, so he wants Taiyo to handle Kurogo and make sure that Shirasagi survives. Taiyo agrees and readies his knife to face Kurogo, he lunges forward at him. But Kurogo catches his hand before he can land a stroke, and he is immediately able to tell that the knife is one that was made by Shinzo, since it is uniquely hollow. It is made specifically so that one can load poison into the hollow point, so he tests it out by stabbing Taiyo with it. From Taiyo's reaction, he can tell that the poison was probably a muscle relaxant made by Nano, so with Taiyo incapacitated, he punches him away. Taiyo is left lying on the floor and bleeding out as Kurogo mocks him for being so naive as to say something like he doesn't want anyone to die. Because no matter what he does, someone is always going to die like Kurogo's daughter or his family. Meanwhile, on the lower floor, Sui faces down the triplets and they recognize that he has talent with a sword, but they still doubt he'll be able to take all of them on at once. Red is specialized in arson and acts of terrorism, Blue is able to slash anything with high-pressure water beams, and Yellow is able to use electricity to rewrite all the data on a computer and fry human brains. So when they work as a team, they are completely unstoppable. Sui calls them arrogant for revealing all their techniques before the fight has even begun, but since they told him their techniques, then it's only fair that he reveals his own. So he informs them that the foundation of the Hinajuku technique is walking on flowers. It involves absorbing all sound and resistance by treading lightly, making it possible to move swiftly and near undetectably. At its core, it is just a basic technique that anyone could realistically master, but its flexibility can be applied to sword skills as well, so he's confident he'll be able to handle all three of them at once. The triplets all prepare their techniques and combine them into one massive attack aimed at Sui, so as the huge ball is hurtling towards him, Sui prepares his sword to counter and performs a perfect parry, while also defeating all three twins. Now that he is done with his job, he wants to get back up to Taiyo as soon as possible since he doesn't expect him to last very long against Kurogo. But he is then surprised as he feels a terrifying presence behind him. But as he turns around and tries to slash at it, there's nothing there, so he is left wondering what that could have been. Back with Taiyo, Kurogo asks him if he understands the despair that comes with losing one's family, and Taiyo is all too aware of how agonizing it feels, but throughout his suffering, there was always someone there for him. He now has a new family, so he wants to move on. He charges forward at Kurogo, and in his head, Kurogo is thinking about how useless Taiyo's efforts are since he has already memorized every possible Yuzakura family technique that Taiyo could use, but he wasn't expecting what happened next. As Taiyo was running towards him, he begins using the Hinajuku walking technique, and with it, he vanishes from Kurogo's line of sight, appearing behind him instead. Before he started this mission, Kyo had informed Taiyo that a professional would have done their research on him, so none of the techniques he has learnt would work against them. However, the security of knowledge can often blunt one ability to adapt, so even if it is not a perfect replication, the walking technique was enough to throw Kurogo off his game and despite knowing every technique Taiyo is going to use and how he will use it, he doesn't have enough time to come up with countermeasures anymore and ultimately, that leads to his defeat. Kurogo acknowledges that Taiyo has bested him and he has no regrets since he always expected things to end up this way for him. He gave up on everything other than revenge a long time ago, but Taiyo chose to struggle on through the hardships. Out of respect for Taiyo's resilience, Kurogo gives him a note containing the information he knows about the culprit behind the death of Taiyo's family. But immediately after, Kurogo gets shot through the throat. 
Kurogon dies shortly after and Taiyo can't believe what just happened. But as Sui returns, he states that Kurogo must have been assassinated to keep him quiet about some huge secret. Taiyo feels deep regret since in the end he wasn't able to succeed in keeping everyone alive. On the note Kurogo had given him, Taiyo finds the tree Kurogo had buried his daughter. He knew he wouldn't get the chance to do it himself. So he grow for Taiyo to place flowers on her grave for him. And inside the knot of the tree, there is a box containing the clue Taiyo is looking for. At the end of the day, Taiyo returns home and is greeted warmly by his family. So even with the depressing events of the day, he can at least smile knowing that he has such wonderful people around him. Since his mission was a success, Taiyo was later invited to his celebratory Hanajiku hot pot. Thanks to him, there were zero victim casualties, so she gives Taiyo a huge helping of rice for being the star of the show. However, he's still not quite understanding what all this is supposed to be. Sue explains that Rin always throws parties like this to congratulate her subordinates and to make it extra special. She even hunts all the animals used with her bare hands. She's happy with her most recent catch, but something she's not happy about is how Kiyo weaseled his way into the party even though he wasn't invited. She tells him to get lost, but Kiyo has a counteroffer ready. If he gets to stay, Rin can have some of his specially brewed alcohol, and that's enough to convince her to make an exception. With the guest list finalized, Sui steps up to cut the meat, and afterwards, Taiyo prepares a portion for Mutsumi. However, Kiyo can't handle anyone feeding Mutsui aside from him, so he stuffs Taiyo's throat with food and offers Mutsui some of his own food instead. Rin scolds Kiyo for being such a meddlesome brother to Mutsui, but Kiyo refuses to listen to someone like her, so a food fight breaks out and the others are forced to run for cover. After things settle down, everyone gets their chance to eat, especially Oga, who is looking but chonky. Meanwhile, Taiyo is over in the corner reflecting on what he learned from Kurogao. This box supposedly contains information relating to the mastermind behind his family's death, but Taiyo is hesitant to open it. In the middle of his contemplation, Mutsumi shows up and scares the daylights out of him. She saw Taiyo looking down, so she came over to check on him. Taiyo says he is fine, but he is just scared of what he may find if he opens the box because it may change everything. When Kuroga was about to finish off the deputy, Taiyo sprang into action to stop him. But for a split second, a thought crossed Taiyo's mind that if he knew who the killer of his family was, he would likely do the same thing. Even if it was just for a moment, Taiyo feels guilty for relating to a killer, so he's reluctant to open the box as it may set him on a path of revenge just like Kurogao. Mutsumi doesn't know what else to do, so she gives Taiyo a kiss on the cheek. Taiyo freaks out a bit because Mutsumi has never done something like this before and she's getting embarrassed as well, but she felt like it was a good moment to do something like that. And besides, Taiyo's reaction shows that even if circumstances change, deep down, he's still always going to be the same person. And even if he does change, she will stay right there beside him. Taiyo thanks her for being so kind, but Mutsui points out that him freaking out accidentally opened the box, revealing that it's just a marble inside. Taiyo doesn't know what to make of it, but Kido then walks in to explain that it's a method of storing information by trapping air bubbles in a marble. Though difficult, it is possible to retrieve that information, however, that is not important right now because Kyo is going to murder Taiyo for having Mutsui kiss him. Luckily, Rin steps in to hold Kyo back, but he is mad enough that he may really kill Taiyo if he catches him, so Rin tells him to take Mutsumi and get as far away from here as possible until Kyo calms down. Taiyo later returns home with Mutsumi and he complains about feeling unusually heavy today, but then he realizes it's just Ayaka sitting in his head. He tells her to get off him, and it's already weird enough that she's here to begin with, but she's also wearing a maid outfit. Mutsumi explains that she asked Ayaka to come work here as a maid since she was going to be hanging around them anyway. Ayaka has great assassination skills as a spy, but since she also has to go undercover sometimes, she is well versed in housekeeping as well. Taiyo still has his reservation since it can't be good to let an outside spy stay in the house, but Mutsumi thought it would be okay since it's Ayaka. As a Taiyo stan, Ayaka is aware of everything involving Taiyo's recent mission, including the optical marble drive in his pocket, so she grabs it and hands it off to Shin who gives it a good look. It's old and damaged, but she should be able to retrieve the data from it, although it's going to take a while to process it. Taiyo asks how Shin even knew about the drive, so Ayaka explains that she went through the effort of informing her ahead of time since she's the only one that can retrieve the data. Ayaka also informs Taiyo that the bounty on his head has gone up again, so there are even more people out to kill him in the most painful way possible. And she thinks that's kinda hot. Anyway, if Taiyo plans on protecting Mutsuni, he's going to have to be able to protect himself. So for his own good, and definitely not because Ayaka enjoys it, she's going to attempt to assassinate him on a daily basis. Taiyo asks Mutsumi again if she's sure it's a good idea to have Ayaka stay here, but Mutsumi thinks Ayaka is cute, so she's okay with it. 
By the end of the day, Taiyo is even more exhausted after having to deal with Ayaka's antics, so Musumi offers to make him some tea so he'll feel better. Taiyo tells her he'll have some tea later, but first he wants to have a bath and get some sleep. While he's in the bath, Ayaka pops out of the tub with the camera to get pictures of Taiyo for her homework folder, and then she attacks him with a bottle of acid shampoo. However, as she was squirting a Taiyo, she accidentally sets off one of the house traps, so the bath water becomes electrified and she is shocked in place. Despite her trying to kill him a few moments ago, Taiyo still doesn't want to let her suffer the same fate, so he's going to help her. He smashes through the wall to get to the main power source, and then he holds Ayaka to transfer some of the electricity and eventually blow up the main power source. They both manage to get out of there, and while Taiyo is on top of her, he tells Ayaka that he doesn't mind the training, but she shouldn't do reckless things like that anymore. However, as Kiyo walks in on Taiyo, his position and lack of clothes make it really difficult to beat the allegations of cheating, and he can't ask Ayaka to explain because she's totally enjoying this. Kyo threatens Taiyo with a medieval torture device so he is forced to run away but naked while Ayaka also follows behind in hopes of continuing where they left off. And despite seeing all this, Mutsumi just thinks it's normal. A while later, Taiyo is about to go on his next mission when Mutsumi reminds him that he forgot his phone. Also, there seems to be someone called Kaoru calling him, but Taiyo immediately snatched the phone and says it was no one important. After he leaves, Ayaka walks up behind Mutsumi and tells her that Taiyo is probably cheating on her. Mutsumi trusts Taiyo, so she says he's probably just busy with spy work, but Ayaka is convinced that he must be cheating. He always showers after he gets home. He turns off his GPS so that Ayaka can't track him, and he keeps slipping away for unknown reasons even when Ayaka tries following him. Later in the day, Mutsumi is out in the park with Taiyo, and even though Taiyo is exhausted from all the work he has been doing lately, she is glad to spend some quality time with him like this. They are on a walk because Mutsumi is the one in charge of walking Goliath, and the reason it's her job is because Goliath won't allow anyone other than her to walk him. Goliath is a special breed wolf dog that was produced through repeated genetic fuckery, so he is able to grow larger at will, has an insanely durable body, and has a really long lifespan. In fact, according to what she's been told, Goliath has been serving the Yozakura family since Mutsumi's great-great-grandmother was still alive. He's even strong enough for her to ride on, but when Mutsumi tells Taiyo to get on as well, he gets swatted off because Goliath refuses to have any rum other than Mutsumi's on his back. Since Goliath isn't allowing Taiyo to ride him, Mutsumi suggests Taiyo can just hold on to the leash and follow along. But follow along is a loose term since Taiyo gets dragged around faster than a bullet train, up a building, and across a lake. By the time the walk is over, Taiyo isn't looking so good, and while he's recovering, some kids walk up to Goliath since they've never seen such a huge dog before. It all seems perfectly harmless, but as Mutsumi walks over to talk to the kids, we then see a sinister clown targeting her, and he apparently rigged the kids' balloons with explosives just to get to her. Mutsumi grabs the kids to protect them, and while Goliath tried to protect her as well, Taiyo was the one who really shielded everyone from the blast. Taiyo is just glad that everyone is okay, but for someone to hurt her Taiyo like this, Mutsumi is going to get revenge back in blood. She orders Goliath to track down the culprit, and from a few pieces of the explosive, Goliath is able to track down the exact location of the clown instantly, so he leaps into action. In the meantime, Mutsumi can use the bomb fragments to track the transmission signal using Shin's system, and in doing so, she gets a direct line of contact with the clown that attempted to assassinate her. The clown is honestly surprised that Mutsumi is still alive, but from the crude bombing attempts as well as the flawed plan that got bystanders involved, Mutsumi can tell that the clown must be a third-rate assassin at best. Mutsumi may not have any powers of her own, but it is foolish to think that makes her an easy target, since she has reliable people around her, like Goliath who has just found the clown. After Goliath was done mangling the clown, he returned to the park and took a nap beside Mutsumi while she tended to Taiyo's wounds. Taiyo says he's fine, but then his phone starts ringing, so Taiyo says he needs to get back to the house quickly. Mutsumi understands that he's got private business to attend to, so she asks Goliath to take them both home. Goliath then grabs Taiyo and throws him and Mutsumi onto his back. Taiyo asks if Goliath is really okay with letting him ride, but after Taiyo took an explosion from Mutsumi, Goliath approves of him a little more than before. They eventually get home and Taiyo is glad he made it just in time, but then Ayaka attacks him out of nowhere and accuses him of cheating. Taiyo tries to explain that it's not what she thinks, but Ayaka found proof of him meeting with another girl. And with the evidence stacked against him, Kiyo intends to punish him with another medieval torture device. However, as before Taiyo is maimed, the girl from the picture interrupts and introduces herself as Momiji, a member of Hinanchiku. She's here to deliver a package for Taiyo, but Taiyo had asked her to meet him in secret for the handover so that no one would know. 
That was the initial arrangement, but her grandpa Kaoru told her that it may be better to let everyone know about it to avoid misunderstandings like this. Mutsumi remembers Taiyo receiving calls from someone called Kaoru, and it was the old man who Taiyo had contacted to help him acquire this, a container of Kyo's favorite tea leaves. Taiyo had remembered Mutsumi talking about how they were out of Kyo's tea leaves, but dark sweet is notoriously hard to make due to its exotic ingredients. So Taiyo went through a lot of trouble to gather its ingredients secretly, so he could replenish Kyo's stock as thanks for all the help he's given. The reason he didn't tell Mutsumi was because Kyo was bound to find out if she knew, so Taiyo apologizes for making her worry for nothing. Kyo can't believe that despite everything he has done to Taiyo, he still went this far to do something nice for him. So he feels really bad about how he treated him. Everyone sits down to enjoy some of the tea, and Ayaka wants to apologize to Taiyo for doubting his intentions. On the other hand, even though Kyo feels bad about mistreating Taiyo, he still refuses to apologize to him. So Mutsui tells Goliath to sit on him until he gives Taiyo an apology. This was the end of episode 10. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to not miss the next part.